You're in the Paracast, the gold standard of paranormal radio. And now, here's Gene Steinberg. You know, we got an email from one listener who complains that Chris is always heard eating on the air. And I have to tell you, I've been working with Chris now about six years. I think once or twice he was just in the final stages of finishing his breakfast. But that's about it. I mean, a guy has to eat. Like right now. <laughs> He's eating breakfast right now, by the way. And since this person apparently has some interest in Chris eating and being well-fed and everything and being healthy, especially since he had these health issues earlier this year, right now, I assure you, Chris is eating. What are you having for breakfast? Oh, I'm breakfast burrito. A breakfast burrito. Yeah, it's really good. Actually, I think what they're picking up on is my nicotine gum. Sometimes I get nervous and when I start chewing my gum and I forget to turn my mic off, I think that's what they're picking up on. I never eat, uh, <laughs> except for today, um, I never eat during the show. I think that's the height of unprofessionalism. But uh, occasionally uh, chewing a piece in, of my nicotine gum, yeah, I've done that. And I'll, I'll just make sure that my mic's off when I'm chewing and, and I won't chew when it's on. How's that? You just give me something to chew on. When you hear that little thump, by the way, which we try to edit out on the episodes, that's him turning off his mic. He has a little switch on the front of his mic. But apparently the people at Blue Microphones aren't capable of putting in a switch there that doesn't have an audible impact. That's how it goes. You know, when I think about all these contacts with higher beings who talk about peace and love and brotherhood, and then we have the mass shootings in San Bernardino, California. And the previous week, we had shootings over at a Planned Parenthood center in Colorado. And I think, where's E.T.? Where's anyone watching all this carnage and not doing anything about it? I don't want to be political on the show. But, I mean, you just can't take this sitting down. And I was just going to mention that I saw online a animated GIF of you know, map the United States. And in order, as the months scroll by, they would flash a red circle where one of these mass shootings occurred around the country. And right now we're well ahead of the one a day, believe it or not. We're at 355, I think, mass, mass shootings. And we're only, what, about 330 days through the year here. So, or 356. So it'd be about 330 something days. Yeah. So that's more than one a day. And I noticed if you if you look at it carefully, you'll notice that certain areas of the country, it, it, it's almost like going clockwise around around the uh, southern portion of uh, the southern tier of the United States. And then a very dramatic march from West Coast to East Coast. I, I, I just found it very compelling. I, I need to look at it a little bit uh, you know, more closely and see if I can slow it down because they really do flash all these um, – these locations by very quickly, so it's hard to really, you know, try to ascertain if there is a pattern in there. And it, it did look like a pattern to me. It seemed to be um, pulsing in a way that uh, would indicate that there's some some sort of patterning in there. And I, you know, I, I mentioned this to Gene. He says, "Oh, we got we got to bring that up because, <laughs> you know, that sounds like a conspiracy theory." Well, I don't, you know, I just happen to notice. It. What do you think, Gene? That is interesting because remember, in all these incidents. We have separate actors not acting in concert with one another. Different people having different problems. And as of the time we're recording this show, we don't know whether San Bernardino is an incident involving workplace violence, an act of terrorism, or some combination of the two. And this is one of the things that I have a beef with, with the way that the commentators on TV address it. It has to be either workplace violence or an act of terror. How about both? How something in the workplace inspired them to perform what would be considered a terrorist act. You know, this binary thinking, you know, doesn't work very well. I'm wondering about all these shooting drills that they've been having there, one a month, I think. And I think at first when, when stuff started happening, people just thought it was another drill. That that comes up a lot, these shooting things. uh Nine eleven happened during drills. I mean, I could go down the list of events that have been accompanied by a drill for that exact same thing, which uh, that, that always seems suspicious to me. 
Really weird, really strange, and you have to wonder here whether any of these conspiracy theories apply. And, you know, that takes us to the fringe of what we do here. But a pattern, a map showing a pattern in these events is far and above just random crazy people doing something. It is crazy people, maybe, but from different places, different motives. I don't know. And if you have a map that could show a pattern, would that predict the next event? I didn't think about that. That's an interesting thought. But in the meantime, I'm having a breakfast burrito that was left to me by aliens. Is that different than having a pancake left by aliens to some Wisconsin farmer? Joe Simonton, Wisconsin farmer back in the 50s or 60s. E.T. lands and he sees something being cooked or prepared. And he says, yeah, can I have one of those? And they give him this pancake thing that looked like a spoiled pancake. I guess E.T. likes to eat spoiled pancakes. But, you know, receiving foodstuffs from strange creatures, that's something that happens throughout history. And that brings us to our guest this week, Joshua Cutchin. He's author of a book called A Trojan Feast, The Food and Drink Offerings of Aliens, Fairies, and Sasquatch. And let me just read what the publisher says about it. You've been warned... Accept food from fairies and you'll never escape their realm, according to European folklore. Accept food from Sasquatch and you will forever be trapped in the spirit world, according to indigenous North American tales. And today, abductees, at least those who have returned, often report being offered strange beverages from their captors. Are these similarities mere coincidence or is something more at play? Hmm. I don't know. But with Joe Simonton, though, it doesn't seem that he was in any way tethered to the aliens or whatever they were. He just went upon his life. I guess he had his five minutes of fame. Now, you'll notice I'm not saying that Joe Simonton had 15 minutes of fame because I don't think he was famous long enough for that to have occurred. I think he's pretty much a relic in the history of the UFO field, pretty much a curiosity. And we've had a few over the years. But, you know, when our guest comes on... Maybe he'll find them more significant. Well, I I seem to remember that he um, described the taste as being like somewhat like sawdust and cardboard or something. (laughs) Well, you know, maybe the thing is here is that my wife doesn't cook very much. And maybe, you know, if she cooked, maybe then what she does would be like what? Sawdust and cardboard. That doesn't sound very good. It, isn't that pancake still around? I think it's in like some collection or museum or something. Or We'll have to ask uh, Joshua about that. Yeah, that would be really fascinating. I think it's still around. It's probably pretty stale by now. Well, I suppose if you canned it, it would be all right, right? <laughs> How about canned pancake? Canned um, alien pancake? I don't know. I think I'm going to have to pass on that one, Gene. Well, if you I think eat my it, alien you- breakfast burrito... Um, was very good, and um, obviously these aliens have uh, visited Mexico, so that was very good. I like. Okay, it. so you've just eaten an alien food stuff, uh-huh. and does that mean that something weird's going to happen to you? Well, yeah, I'm on the show with you. I think that that, that rates. Well, that's true, but then I'm on the show with you. Yeah. Well. So there you go. And by yeah. the way, we want you to go to plus.theparacast.com, P-L-U-S dot theparacast.com to learn about the Paracast Plus, our premium package, the exclusive After the Paracast podcast, the ad-free version of this show, more stuff, low rates, special prizes for long-term subscriptions, plus.theparacast.com. Joshua Cutchin, waiting in the wings with Gene and Chris. You're in the Paracast. Let's take a moment to mention Alternate Perceptions magazine. You know, it's been publishing since 1985, and it's been online since 2002. Each month, APMagazine.info brings new articles, interviews, and commentary on the worlds of mysteries, including UFOs, archaeological anomalies, ghost hunting, and news. 
It's edited by Brent Rains and Dr. Greg Little. And many of the top writers, such as Brad Steiger, are frequent contributors. That's apmagazine.info. So here's what happened. I was placing an order online. The site went down. It took hours before it returned, but I'd already placed the order with another company. If your site goes down, you could lose business. And if you have a business or personal site, you'll want to know it's easy to run and it will stay online. At iWeb, your site is hosted on one of the most reliable networks in the world. Talk to a sales rep at iWeb.com. Use the promo code Tech Night Owl for a special discount. Concerned about harmful contaminants in your water? Look to ProPure, the most trusted name in gravity water filtration systems. ProPure, with the silver infused Pro 1 G 2.0 filter, removes over 200 contaminants, including VOCs, heavy metals, chloramines, pesticides, pharmaceuticals, fluorides, and radiologicals. We don't just say it, we back it up. The Pro 1 G 2.0 filter is NSF 42 certified and independently tested to meet NSF. SF-53 and P-231 standards. Pro Pure Water, the way nature meant it to be. Clean, crisp, and refreshing. Purchase with confidence in quality, performance, and customer service. Take advantage of our biggest holiday 25% off sale going on now. Visit your authorized Pro Pure dealer or ProPureUSA.com. That's P-R-O-P-U-R-U-S-A.com. Or call 800-544-3533. 800-544-3533. Hi, I'm Dr. Sam Nussbaum with the Anthem Foundation. Premature birth is the leading cause of death of babies and disabilities for children. That's why we support the March of Dimes to help mothers have full-term pregnancies and healthy babies. Join us in supporting cutting-edge research, treatment and outreach to help moms during their pregnancy, and give every baby a healthy start in life. Learn how you can help at marchofdimes.org. My name is Bill Bonner, and I have an important message. Right now, the highest levels of government are struggling against an inevitable crisis, but they're about to lose control. When this happens, it will rip our country apart in ways you never imagined, from where we shop to the family you want to protect. Look, I've made predictions like this before. A few years ago, I warned that the housing prices would collapse. Before that, I warned that dot-com companies would crash, and they did. Those who listened had a chance to save themselves. But this has nothing to do with the stock market. This will affect us all. I've posted a free video at disappearingdollar.com. Maybe you'll disagree with my conclusions, but first, you need to watch this video and see the facts for yourself. You can watch the video for free right now by going to disappearingdollar.com. Again, that's disappearingdollar.com. By now, you know that wireless technology like cell phones do, in fact, pose dangers to the health and privacy of everyone. Blocket Pocket's wide range of products are unmatched in providing the protection you deserve. No scare tactics, just common sense. BlockitPocket.com offers quality, American made options to alleviate and eliminate these invisible dangers. Learn more at BlockitPocket.com or call 888 315 9618. BlockitPocket.com, enhancing health and privacy. We'd like to hear from you. If you have a comment or question about the Paracast, send it to news at theparacast.com. That's news at theparacast.com. And don't forget to visit our famous Paracast community forums at forum.theparacast.com. We're talking about foodstuffs from the aliens, Sasquatch, fairies, the gods. Our guest is Joshua Cutchin. And he's author of a fascinating book called A Trojan Feast, The Food and Drink Offerings of Aliens, Fairies, and Sasquatch. Now, in our little conversation ahead of this interview, I said, okay, Joshua, tell me where you're from. And it's a town called? Decula. Decula, Georgia. It's about uh, halfway between Athens and Atlanta for anybody in this region. Well, I recall being halfway when I lived in Alabama. I was in a town halfway between Birmingham and Atlanta. Really? Uh, yeah. what, whereabouts? Like Piedmont. Okay. Alabama. You know where that is? Uh, I, have a, I have some vague sense. My wife's uh, grandmother actually lives in Opelika, so we spend some time in Alabama from time to time. Yes, I know where that is, unfortunately. The radio station there 
And it's still in existence. Is WPID, the first radio station I worked at back in the late 1960s. And I worked there for about three or four months. And then the new manager decided to hire his nephew. And he said, okay, this is your last day. You don't give me notice? Well, no. I'm hiring my nephew. Anything wrong with my work? No, I'm just hiring my nephew. WPID, we used to say, it stands for, well, Piedmont is dead. Just some good old-fashioned nepotism, I suppose. Yes, I don't think he lasted too long (laughs) at that job because a year or two later, I was passing by and I stopped at the station because I saw the pickup truck or whatever vehicle he was driving of the owner. And I said, hi there. He said, well, you know, I'm kind of sorry we had to let you go there, but I let the manager I hired go also. So, (laughs) you know, maybe that was poetic justice. You know, whenever we talk about alien or foodstuffs from strange creatures, I think of this silly episode many years ago involving a farmer from, was it Eagle River, Wisconsin or something like that? Mm -hmm. I still remember at my age, Joe Simonton, who received what we call pancakes from E.T. What can you say about that one before we really jump into it with full diving suits? Yeah, well, it's 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 really the poster child for this whole uh, phenomena in a nutshell, and why it applies to the modern UFO phenomena. Um, Simonton was in his house in the morning of uh, April eighteenth, nineteen sixty one, and he uh, heard this strange sound that sounded like radials on wet pavement uh, from out coming from outside. And he looks into his yard, and sitting there is this bowl shaped craft, like two two inverted bowls put together, real shiny. And uh, inside are three individuals that he said looked like dark skinned Italians, <laughs> as it were, each about five feet tall, uh, dressed in dark outfits and some knitted, knitted, knitted headgear. And one of them holds aloft this 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 jug and obviously gestures for water. So Simonton, being this good Wisconsin farmer, goes and fetches some water from inside the house and brings it back out. At this point, Simonton notices that one of the other pilots of this craft is frying food on, quote-unquote, some sort of flameless griddle. Um, He sees that they look like some sort of uh, small, round pancakes. Sometimes you'll hear them alternately described as cookies, but they have all these holes in them in this real bizarre fashion. And apparently these uh, entities noted that Simon was taking an interest in this and uh, gave him uh, four of these, actually. Uh, He kept one. Uh, he gave one to a local judge, he gave one to uh, J. Allen Hynek, and he gave one to NICAP. Analysis was done, said it was all mundane ingredients, hydrogenated oil and buckwheat. You'll hear some rumors from time to time about there being unknown grains in the pancake. I've never found any real any real uh, substantiation to that rumor. In tying in with my interests and in how alien activity uh, ties in with uh, fairy phenomena, there were a race of uh, fairies in uh, the Netherlands who would uh, actually give uh, farmers pancakes when they were in the field and fresh water as well. They were called the Unerbensky. So the more you look into all these, uh, all these different cases, the more you see these little connections that are really, really interesting and compelling. Now, what is your take on this? Obviously, the pancakes were conventional. Is this something he made up himself to get some fame and fortune? What? Oh, well, you know, it's... <laughs> I, I really don't know because it's the only case that we have where we actually have something, one of these foodstuffs uh, returned that is actually, you know, a physical object, which doesn't really seem to jive with what I have seen from this aspect of the phenomena as a whole. You know, the, the conventional explanation was that Simonton made the pancakes himself and was daydreaming. And I really don't buy that. I think what is more interesting to me is the fact that uh, there are these physical pancakes, which he said that tasted awful. And it's interesting, if you look at the fairy lore, fairies would often cloak detritus, leaves, twigs, branches, etc., in glamour to appear appealing. But in reality, it was just, you know, stuff that you'd find on the forest floor that you wouldn't want to eat. It also ties into what uh, fairies would eat. They would actually not eat actual food. They would only deprive food of its essence, or foison. And uh, the food that you would eat if it had been deprived of its essence would be unfit for human consumption. So there's an interesting little parallel there, too. Uh, part of me believes that, you know, <laughs> part, of me, part of me believes that this was almost like a shell or a vehicle for Simon to experience something else. Having said that, I don't know why we don't have more physical evidence in other such cases. That is so peculiar. Now, whatever happened to Simonton, I know he was interviewed on radio and TV. I even heard him. Shows you how old I am. But I was really mm-hmm. young then. I heard him on the Long John Nebel radio show, and he sounded like 
what you expect a Wisconsin farmer to sound like, you know, regular, normal guy. Yeah, by all accounts, I believe that he just lived a, a relative, relatively calm life for the rest of his life. Uh, I know that there's been some interest in possibly putting together a documentary around this case, um, but I haven't heard any new uh, new motion on that front. So looking at history here, and we're talking about encountering strange beings or creatures and being offered or choosing to partake of foodstuffs of one sort or another – where did your research begin? What attracted you to this? Well, you know, I've always been interested in these sort of subjects, but uh, my my real interest has always been in this one aspect that no one ever seemed to talk about, which was the food taboo in fairy lore. Uh, if you were to be given food by a fairy, if you were walking down a country lane and they offered you something to eat or drink and you took it and you ate or drank with it, you had to go with them and be, st- and be stuck forever. I always saw certain parallels between that and a lot of abduction cases. And even contactee cases as well, where people are given foodstuffs to eat and drink. Um, the reason that I saw that as being a parallel is because you know these are relatively short interactions. It doesn't seem like this would be given for any sort of sustenance. It has to be given to administer some sort of effect. I wasn't sure how deep the connection was, though, until I was reading uh, J. Robert Alley's Raincoast Sasquatch, which is a great book. Um, it talks about Sasquatch sightings along the upper Pacific Northwest, stretching through Alaska. And at one point, he mentions that uh, some of the tribes in uh, in in upper upper Canada and the Alaska area actually felt that if you were to take food from a Sasquatch, you would be trapped with the Sasquatch forever. And that, to me, was just too tantalizing of a tidbit to uh, to pass up. Um, anthropologists will tell you that this entire uh, this entire uh, myth of being trapped with those that you eat is tied to the uh, Greek myth of Persephone, uh, who was the daughter of Demeter, goddess of the grain, and uh, Hades actually abducted her to the underworld and was commanded to release her, but tricked her into eating a uh, cursed pomegranate. And once she had consumed the seed, she had to stay with uh, Hades for her forever. Let's do our break here, then sure. we'll go back to Greek mythology. We have Joshua Cutchin with Gene and Chris. You're in The Paracast. <laughs> Thank you for listening to GCN. Visit GCNlive.com today. We use mobile devices right against our bodies every day, but growing scientific evidence has emerged showing serious health risks associated with exposure to EMF radiation emitted from these devices. The solution is Defender Shield, the most effective mobile radiation shielding ever developed. Defender Shield blocks virtually 100% of EMF radiation from cell phones, tablets, and laptops and starts at just $64.99. Buy now at DefenderShield.com. For 10% off, use promo code GCN. DefenderShield.com, the worldwide leader in mobile radiation shielding. Are your Google search results killing you? Unflattering content in blogs, news articles, online reviews, social media, or other sources can jeopardize your reputation, your business, and your livelihood. Let Reputation.com help. Our patented technology will make the truth about you more visible while pushing down unwanted negative content. Improve your Google search results. Call Reputation.com at 1-800-831-0771 for a free consultation. That's 800-831-0771. Attention all men. Are you urinating more frequently? Do you wake up to urinate? Are you having a slower, weaker stream? Don't ignore the warning signs of your aging prostate. Get your free bottle of Super Beta Prostate. Super Beta Prostate is guaranteed to support a more complete emptying of your bladder, a fuller, stronger stream, and less waking at night to urinate. Super Beta Prostate is a product that I really like. I endorse it. I use it myself. I was very pleasantly surprised that Super Beta Prostate helped me fairly quickly. Super Beta Prostate is formulated with a natural plant enzyme called beta cytosterol. It's so powerful, you'd have to take 100 Saul Palmetto pills to get the same sterols as just one Super Beta Prostate tablet. Don't ignore the warning signs of your aging prostate. Call now to get your free bottle of Super Beta Prostate. Call 1-800-853-1203. That's 1-800-853-1203. 800-853-1203. This is Dan Pilla. Do you owe the IRS money you can't pay? Are tax debts crippling you? I've defended people from the IRS for over 30 years. I've helped thousands and I can help you too. I wrote the book on IRS settlement and I'm telling you, 
There's no such thing as a hopeless case. Call 800-34-NO-TAX to finally get free of IRS debt. With the IRS's new programs, there's never been a better time to solve your problem. Call 800-34-NO-TAX. That's 800-34-NO-TAX or my website, danpilla.com. Hi, Peter Vaccaro for ParanormalDate.com. Are you looking for love in all the wrong places? Now you have a chance to change that by signing up for free at ParanormalDate.com. This incredible dating site puts people of like minds together. People who are interested in the strange, the unusual, mysteries, ghosts, UFOs, and the afterlife, and so much more. ParanormalDate.com was developed for you, people seeking a viable alternative to the other dating services. You can join for free by going to ParanormalDate.com, and if you decide you like it and want to connect with people, use the code GEORGE for a substantial discount. Mark Rawlings, president of ParanormalDate.com, says so many people hunger to share their experiences about the paranormal, the unexplainable, or the afterlife, and so much more, and this is the source for them to meet and share that common interest. So sign up for free at ParanormalDate.com, ParanormalDate.com and use the code GEORGE if you decide to connect with someone you like. Hey, Berkey Guy here. Are you still drinking unfiltered tap water? Does your water contain chlorine or fluoride? Will you have drinkable water in an emergency? The Berkey Guy is here to help you remove these and other potential contaminants from your water, thus helping you drink clean, purified water. We offer Berkey water purification systems at the lowest available prices online. Don't go another moment without Berkey System. Over the last 10 years, we've helped thousands drink clean, purified water. Join them by visiting GoBerkey.com or call me, the Berkey Guy, at 877-886- 3653. That's 877-886-3653. Hey, this is Marie D. Jones, the author of This Book is from the Future, and you are listening to the Paracast, the gold standard of paranormal radio. All righty. Joshua Cutchin is here. We are talking about a fascinating book, which is called A Trojan Feast, The Food and Drink Offerings of Aliens, Fairies, and Sasquatch. In attempting to look at the genesis of this effect, we explored Greek mythology. Joshua, you want to go a little further into that? Absolutely. So you'll have people citing uh, the Persephone myth as the reason that this widespread cultural belief exists that to consume with the other, you'll be trapped with the other. And I buy that for the entire Eurasian landmass and even possibly with the idea that some ideas like that might extend into Africa. But when you're dealing with First Nations tribes on the North American continent and when you're dealing with similar restrictions that are placed on people by ayahuasca shamans, I have a hard time believing that that is some sort of diffusion of the Persephone myth across the ocean. So I I, I really wanted to look into see if there was something else uh, to that particular food taboo and how, if any way, it could apply to the abduction phenomena. Now, of course, this is the part where you have to sort of stop and check yourself. Obviously, we wouldn't have any tales about modern abductees taking and receiving food and coming back if they never came back. (laughs) So I and the think other thing here to... about how many people who've been abducted didn't come back. Now, for your reference, last week we had a discussion about abductions with Kathleen Marden. You know her? Mm-hmm. Yes. Okay. Mm-hmm. okay. So that's the first thing that you raise there, which is, of course, if they haven't come back, we don't know what happened. But do we have any record of people disappearing that you might attribute to possibly it was related to abductions? Well, you know, it's interesting. I think a lot of people would uh, bring in the work of uh, David Politis, even though I don't think he would necessarily would, would be comfortable standing beside that fact. <laughs> yeah, exactly. How about Al- Albert Osman? Albert Osman, yeah. I, I've actually referred to David's work as sort of like a, a paranormal Rorschach test. Whatever you want to see, you will see in there. But yeah, I guess what I was getting at is that uh, you have people who are taken and who are given food – and who still return. So obviously we have to reinterpret what not being able to return home means. And the way that I sort of got around to it in my own head was perhaps that means that you'll never be able to figuratively return home again. Your world will never be the same after this particular experience. You mentioned Albert Osman. It's probably the most famous case of Sasquatch abduction. Osman was taken in, I believe, his affidavit was in 1957, so I think it was sometime in the, uh, the 30s that he was actually taken by Sasquatch. It's interesting because finding tales about Sasquatch abduction are kind of hard, and finding tales that are credible are even harder, and finding tales that are credible where they've been given something to eat are 
are even harder than that. Osman was a prospector working in British Columbia, and he was carried uh, while asleep in his sleeping bag by some sort of large, hairy hominid. And after three hours, he was dumped into this small valley, and he was uh, surrounded by the Sasquatch family. Over the course of a couple of days, you know, he had some of his own provisions, but he was also given some uh, sweet roots that he could describe them with that. They said that they had a fast, a satisfying taste. This is interesting to me because a lot of the foodstuffs that people receive tend to fall into uh, sweeter categories. It's really difficult trying to categorize all of this stuff because sometimes you'll have people just remember that they ate something or that they drank something or they took my glass of water and dropped a pill into it and it changed into something else. Well, do you classify that as water, an alien drink or an alien pill? You know, how do you <laughs> how do you classify those? Overall, these sweet roots that Osman tried tend to fit with that particular flavor profile. It's also interesting that Osman was able to escape by using consumables. He actually had the uh, Sasquatch father, he tricked him into eating uh, his tobacco snuff that Sasquatch allegedly washed down his awful meal of, of snuff with a boiling hot coffee and all the grounds. So uh, it's interesting how a food played a role in that particular account. Now, what I think of here is the possibility here, if, if this is happening, that this food compels you to stay with your abductors or those with whom you're in contact. Is there some kind of poison in there possibly that is affecting you? Well, I'm looking I, for a real explanation in terms of the physical world as opposed to some spiritual world thing. But, of course, that may not apply. I'm neither a fan of the uh, objective or the subjective, actually. <laughs> so I don't know if I'm entirely qualified to answer that. I would think that the sort of conclusions that I arrived at lead me to believe that there is some sort of greater symbolic meaning to this consumption. I don't think it's necessarily an objective poison or like you're consuming a drink that has nanotransmitters in it or something. I think more about it possibly being a way to gain access to someone's psyche or to influence their uh, worldview. You know, I think of the Proustian effect of, of smelling or seeing or tasting something and it recalling past memories. Well, in, in my conclusion, which is the only chapter of the book that I actually present in first person because I wanted to make it very clear that I had my opinions and I had my data, which were very different things. The first time I ever saw Planet of the Apes was also the first time that I ever had peanut butter pie. <laughs> I love peanut butter pie to this day, but I will never forget taking those bites of peanut butter pie while Charlton Heston is standing in front of Dr. Zayas being interrogated. And that's a, I was eight years old or something. It's a pretty nihilistic film for an eight-year-old. To this day, I get a little bit of a sinking feeling in my gut whenever I eat peanut butter pie. So if I was abducted and aliens really wanted to sell me on a message about an impending apocalypse... Maybe they would present me with peanut butter pie, and that would have a similar effect. That relate. Um, we're sort of the, the sum total of our experience, and I think that uh, in terms of the, the era in which you grow up in, you might have certain images and certain aspects of the zeitgeist which are imprinted upon you. So, This is getting back to what we were talking about before, about if you were abducted, uh, they could probably really do a number on your head if they offered you peanut butter pie. How many cases do we have of fey folk, um, aliens, whatever, or whomever, offering a contactee, abductee, um, experiencer something that they really like and then that they can identify with? It seems to me that most often what, what you encounter in the literature, I'm thinking, you know, Evans Weiss, uh, Fairy Faith in the Celtic Countries, uh, other books, uh, Passage to Magonia, Passport or Passage, I forget, uh, no valet seminal work. You don't normally equate these experiences with the the victim or experiencer being offered something familiar or right. something that they really like. It's, it's interesting. Um, there was a, an article uh, posted to the UFO updates by Nick Pope a while back, back in back in the day, where he mentioned that uh, that food and drink didn't really seem to feature that much in abduction reports. And honestly, I mean, if you if you look at the way that the phenomena recontextualizes itself, I would argue that pills and injections are just as much a variation on this food trope as anything else. Um, in terms of things being actually alien, I don't. Well, let me let me walk this back a little bit. The most common things that you see offered are liquids. And as such, there's a I feel like a wider range for how they can be identified. Um, you will have people sort of graft on comparisons to what they were. Um, but as far as an actual like literal comparison, that doesn't occur very much in the in the modern literature. You're very much correct. Um, in 
fairy lore, it would be very common to be given an ale or a wine, um, which oftentimes being fairy struck meant having too much alcohol. So it seems like it would be a very appealing thing to someone who likes their drink to offer them drink. Hey, at least, um, at least little guys party. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, it's 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 interesting. Things are much more recognizable in contactee reports. Uh, the, the, the general manner in which these foodstuffs divide falls upon the abductee and contactee line very clearly. Contactees receive good tasting foods voluntarily and they're usually recognizable. And they're usually, you know, they're, they're, they're usually, you know, you can take it or leave it and they take it and they eat it. And it's the best thing that they've ever had. Abductees are generally forced something. It's generally uh, foul tasting, either meaning bitter or, you know, cloyingly sweet, something along those lines. So, yeah, in terms of in terms of the truly unrecognizable, you, you kind of see that. But you also find these bizarre cases, especially in contactee cases of, um, you know, being given – in rare cases, a steak. Um, I think of you know Orf- Orfeo Angelucci's nectar, which he recognized as a drink. He just didn't recognize it as uh, as you know actually what it really might have been. So yeah, in terms of recognizability, that's another reason that it became kind of difficult uh, to put these into categories. I want to ask an interesting question here about whether these substances, assuming they are substances, are designed to put someone in a state where they imagine. The things that allegedly happened to them. Joshua Cutchin is here with Gene and Chris. You're in the Paracast. Thank you for listening to GCN. Visit GCNlive.com today. Conspiracy Journal is your number one source for the hidden world of the weird and strange. We bring you thought-provoking and controversial material for free-thinking individuals who are seeking what is really going on in our world today. Some of this material may adversely affect you. Other pieces are meant to enlighten. Either way, be prepared to be intrigued by such things as the reality of UFOs, ghosts, strange creatures from time and space, hidden conspiracies, time travel, Nikola Tesla, suppressed technology, and a whole lot more. You can find out more by visiting our website at conspiracyjournal.com. There you can sign up for our free weekly newsletter sent directly to your email address. Find out what they don't want you to know. Paid non-attorney spokesperson Adam Pulaski of the Pulaski Law Firm with principal office in Houston, Texas is the attorney responsible for the content of this ad. This ad is not legal advice and the choice of a lawyer should not be based solely upon advertisement. Services may not be available in all states. Attention Zarelto users. If you or a loved one took Zarelto and suffered a serious bleeding event, you may be entitled to financial compensation. Zarelto is a popular prescription blood thinner used to prevent blood clots and protect patients from strokes. These serious bleeding events have led to numerous cases of hospitalization and even death. Phone lines are open 24-7. Call 800-261-0937. That's 800-261-0937. Most of you know that heart disease is the number one silent killer in the U.S. What if I told you for just $54.95 a month you could fight against heart disease naturally? At Heart and Body Extract, we've been helping thousands of people get back to a healthier heart. Don't just take my word for it. Check out all of the success stories at hbextract.com. Or to order, call 866-295-5305. That's 866-295-5305. hbextract.com. Don't risk it when you can take charge of it. If you're like me, you're concerned about the stock market and the economy. You're asking the questions, but it just doesn't seem that you're getting the right answers. Well, my friends at the Wealth Preservation Institute not only have the answers, but they've put together a free report, How to Survive the Upcoming Economic Collapse and Protect Your 401Ks, IRA Savings, and Retirement Income. Don't hesitate. This report's for free for a limited time by calling 888-772-2929. That's 888-772-2929. Take back your financial lives today. The following is an important holiday inventory announcement from IDStronghold.com. As many of you have come to know, IDStronghold.com is the number one name in quality RFID blocking wallets that actually do as they say and prevent electronic pickpocketing of the new RFID chips found in credit cards, room keys, subway passes, and more. Last year, due to the extreme popularity of giving ID Stronghold wallets and clutches as unique gifts at Christmas time, we ran out of our most popular styles and colors early. 
shipping. The good news is we now have our holiday inventory ready for same-day shipping. We have added many more designs of beautiful leather wallets and clutches, all with state-of-the-art built-in electronic pickpocket shielding from the most respected name in RFID protection, IDStronghold.com. Don't wait and limit your choices of these great gifts. We are expecting another sellout season. These wallets aren't available in stores, so visit IDStronghold.com today. That's IDStronghold.com. Owe $10,000 or more to the IRS? Get on board with the tax admiral. Don't pick on the IRS alone. I'll cut penalties and reduce your overall tax bill. Sometimes I can even get it zeroed out completely. We're an A-rated company helping people clean up their mess with the IRS. If you owe $10,000 or more, then call the tax admiral. Call 800-287-7180. Again, that's 800-287-7180. 800-287-7180. This is Micah Hanks of the Gray Alien Report, and you're listening to the Paracast, the gold standard of paranormal radio. So watch out if someone offers you a drink <laughs> at the bar. Maybe it's E.T. They want to steal you. But what do you think, Joshua, about the possibility here that, number one, assuming it's not a metaphor for something else, you're being given some kind of substance, a drink, food, whatever. It's designed to put your mind in a state where they can control you and make you think things happened that didn't happen and maybe something else happened instead. That's definitely along the lines of, of, the, of the way that I take it. I, I have no qualms about not being a huge fan of the extraterrestrial hypothesis because to me it's a very tidy explanation for a grossly untidy phenomena. Part of that untidiness uh, comes in the fact that not every encounter involves food and drink. I've had some people be like, obviously, it's these entities are giving them an entheogen. It's putting them into this altered state. But A, not every encounter involves that. And B, the entity would have to appear to give you the entheogen to make the entity appear. So that doesn't, <laughs> that doesn't quite wash with me. Um, I do think that there is some significance to the fact that in a vast majority, vast majority of these cases – the uh, offer of food or drink tends to book in the encounter, encounter. It either comes at the beginning or at the end. And it's interesting because there are actually quite a f few uh, handful of encounters where in Phalor, the consumption of food in the fairy realm would actually return you uh, to reality. There was one legend where a young shepherd had joined a fairy ring and he was transported to a fairy palace and he loved it there. Everything he wished for came true and he was told that he could stay as long as he didn't sit from the fountain. And of course, as fairy tale protagonists do, he did and he was returned to the real world. So it's a little inversion on that uh, being kept in fairyland trope that you do see in a lot of uh, abduction encounters. I would say if I'm going to make up a statistic off the top my head, three quarters of abduction cases will feature a food being administered just before letting people out. Thomas Bullard, who wrote the foreword for my book, uh, actually made a similar observation in his uh, Abductions, a Measure of a Mystery, which is a wonderful, wonderful compilation of, of abduction cases where uh, a lot of times some sort of substance would be administered almost to force amnesia upon the ab abductee. Let's uh, turn the tables here a little bit. I have a question from Harry Newton, who's a longtime poster uh, at the Paracast Forums. And we have a question thread where you can ask questions of our guests. And he's uh, wondering about the other way around, uh, the humans offering, putting up offerings uh, of food to paranormal creatures or legends. And uh, his question goes, do you think there's any connection between the food offered by paranormal creatures and beings to people and the food that people offer, gods, uh, spirits, or paranormal creatures. For example, it is traditional to leave food for Santa Claus and his reindeer, but I suspect this is based on a far more ancient custom. I understand in some cultures or religions that food is divided and a portion offered to the spirits or ancestors, and in some cases people are actually buried with food for their journey into the afterlife. His personal favorite is uh, the legend of the Lambton Worm, where it is said that people filled cattle troughs with milk for the worm to drink so it wouldn't eat the people. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's it's one of those great things about looking into this particular subject is because it does open up a lot of other avenues to talk about. You know, I've had a lot of people who have come to me and been like, oh, you've written this food. Is it about how aliens like strawberry ice cream? Well, no, it's not about that. It's about the act of offering. But having said that, I don't think that you can talk about the act of offering of entities to humans without talking about the offerings from humans to, to entities. 
Um, I think this is all very much tied into the similar thing. You know, you had the uh, the Irish tradition of the sin eater. You still have the uh, Dia de los Muertos celebrations where individuals offer food to their departed ones. And the departed actually uh, consume the essence of the food exactly like the fey folk of Celtic lore and uh, leave behind uh, the remnants of the food. You know, it's it's really interesting. Uh, the vast catalog of fairy entities that exist out there, not just the little winged ones, but also the, you know, trolls and the more the, the nastier type all had very specific things that they wanted to be left behind. And, uh, you know, every time they would take this food's essence and leave behind the, the remnants. And of course, this is a convenient way if you're skeptical of saying, well, that's why, you know, the milk that I left out for the fairies is still there. What's compelling to me is how there are plenty of anecdotes about, for example, cats consuming milk that was left out for pixies, becoming ill afterwards, or uh, animals avoiding the offerings that were left out for the fairies, which uh, to me uh, calls to mind a lot of your work, Chris, with cattle mutilations, how uh, oftentimes predators will avoid these sort of uh, tainted offerings. Exactly. Well, I, I love the ones with the um, Irish uh, housewives uh, would be overwhelmed with their daily existence and they'd leave out uh, treats and milk for uh, the brownies to come clean their house for them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, it's, it's interesting. That. Sometimes it's, it's actually helpful and sometimes it's almost like protection money. You know, sometimes it's like, give, right, us, give bribery. us this offering or else we'll beat you up. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, I just thought I'd throw that in there because there are quite a number of ancient traditions Going all the way back to um, you know the old kingdom of Egypt, where where the pharaohs would actually be uh, you know interned with with food, and uh, of course all their slaves would be uh, put to death and, and left with them, and and this whole idea of going somewhere else and taking provisions with you is a very very ancient custom, and I, I agree with you. I, I it's very difficult for me to believe that there isn't some sort of connection when we are talking about the reverse, like like we are here about uh, you know children feasts. Yeah, that's 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 where a lot of my interests lie. I mean, I, I have friends who are like, you don't really believe in that, do you? And of course, that's such a loaded question. What I find most fascinating are the connective bits. And to me, uh, when you have so many bizarre connections, it really does reinforce the, the narrative. And I would even extend this narrative of giving and taking to modern Sasquatch habituators. I mean, how is that really any different? The people leaving food out for the fairies and food out for the pixies, you know? No, it's it's about as close closely related uh, as you can get. And, and there are quite a number of accounts – and still to this day, you see on the on the internet and some of the the Bigfoot shows, people leave out candy, uh, sweet mm -hmm. sweets for these uh, creatures, and allegedly, uh, quite a number of them uh, seem to enjoy that. And that's, uh, you know, I had an interesting uh, story it just reminded me uh, that my grandfather told me from 1918 in Hoquiam, Washington, where a woman contacted the sheriff and said, "There's this this silver haired Bigfoot that's going through my." My salted fish. She had a, a, a fish salting operation, and the thing was in broad daylight. It was was, <laughs> was turning her barrels over and gobbling up these salted fish. And uh, of course, the sheriff was summoned, and they 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 chased it away uh, allegedly. I seem to remember something about how she had left some out for it, and then stopped leaving it, and that's when he came in. Or there there was some twist on there where. It had happened before, and she had she had left food out, and then uh, when she stopped doing that, or, or for some reason she didn't, then it came back, uh, which I find interesting. Have you encountered stories like that, where you have someone that that ceases? to leave offerings or hush money or you know, extortion, <laughs> extortion yeah. food and then have to deal with you know the ramifications of of maybe uh, angering one of these. Uh, fairies or Bigfoot or name, name your creature, you know, a troll. Um, yeah, no, I, I'm, I'm really glad that you asked that question because I was actually going to, I was actually going to bring that up. You know, I have to view modern habituator reports with a great giant <laughs> grain of salt, pardon the food related pun, but I have heard tales of people who uh, have, you know, gotten in, uh, one of these creatures supposedly used to habituation and they leave for an extended period of time to go to the hospital or something and they come back and their livestock is slaughtered again. Apocryphal, but that's you know very much uh, like what you'd see in fairy lore. I mean, if you didn't, uh, there was a, a brownie who actually slaughtered a, a a bunch of livestock 
in uh, the island the island of Inch uh, in Scotland as well. Um, so you'll see, you know, and, and again, it's this interest in our livestock that's <laughs> that's sort of interesting. But uh, yeah, and and they, and they are not averse to taking. I mean, you know, within this uh, giving and taking motif, you also have to talk about about theft, and uh, sometimes uh, the fairies would. Uh, you know, in this idea of taking the essence of food, they would take, you know, uh, a part of the an internal part of an oxen, and the oxen would look okay, but it would have a limp afterwards or something. There are some tales of of things like that going on, um, and you know, you also run into uh, tales of of uh, Sasquatch on, especially in South American plantations, uh, large hairy hominids stealing fruits and stealing foods. I found a I found a great. Incredibly, incredibly apocryphal, probably not well vetted story uh, from uh, from from Russia uh, in 1932 about a craft that had landed in a potato field, and they had these like dog like uh, pets that uh, really liked stealing farmers' milks, milk and eggs, and chicken and their geese, and uh, and they would uh, you know uh, they would uh, uh, take, take they would foul up the livestock feed. They would mutilate the sheep. They would take grain and potatoes from the fields, and they would take uh, grain off of the silo. And you know, I, I included that in the book because not because it seems it sounds especially truthy, and I, I have all my usual uh, qualifications around it. Hey, buyer beware! Um, but it's interesting that even if from a cultural phenomena that these similar motifs of these short entities coming and stealing from us are still you know are are still in our popular. Uh, still our popular culture. Let's go more into the popular culture aspect and more with Joshua Cutchin and Gene and Chris. You're in the Paracast. You are listening to GCN. Visit GCNlive.com today. Attack of the Rockoids has been well received by critics and readers alike. It's a thrill a minute story you'll never forget. A former U.S. military intelligence officer is haunted by intense dreams about a beautiful woman pleading for his help after a terrible battle in outer space. But the dreams turn out to be true and thrust him into a telepathic love affair with a woman whose faraway planet is intent on destroying the Earth. And now the gripping tale continues in The Coming of the Protectors. It's the second book of the Rockoids trilogy, a galaxy-spanning adventure that pits our hapless heroes against powerful, fanatical enemies that threaten the lives of freedom-loving beings everywhere. Attack of the Rockoids and The Coming of the Protectors, classic science fiction at its best, available now. For more details, visit rockoids.com. That's R-O-C-K-O-I-D-S dot com. Don't complain about your cable bill going up and up and up. Do something about it. Grab a pencil and jot down this special number. 1-855-905-MY-TV. The more cable TV rates go up, the better digital satellite TV looks. Say goodbye to the cable guy. And get more of your favorite channels in 100% digital quality for less money. Call 1-855-905-MY-TV. Sign up for packages starting as low as $19.99 and there's no equipment to buy. You get free HD TV upgrade, a free DVR upgrade, and free professional and installation you control what you watch when you watch it record your favorite shows pause and rewind live tv even skip the commercials watch local channels too at just $19.99 what are you waiting for pull out your major credit or debit card call 1-855-905-MY-TV 1-855-905-MY-TV say goodbye to the cable guy cut costs and get more 1-855-905-MY-TV 1-855-905-MY-TV Welcome back to the Paracast, the gold standard of paranormal radio. And now, here's Gene Steinberg. We invite the trickster on the show when we get involved in these discussions. Joshua Cutchins joining us today. Please check our other radio show after the Paracast. To hear it, you got to be a member of the Paracast Plus at plus.theparacast.com, P-L-U-S dot theparacast.com. We have low rates for monthly, annual, five-year, and even lifetime subscriptions. We give free eBooks for a year or more. 
more features coming, plus.thepowercast.com. Just an offhand question, Joshua. Yes. So we have, for example, Sasquatch and UFOs and fairies and all that. Are we just seeing different aspects of the same thing? Well, what I've become fond of saying uh, is that I am extremely interested in where the Venn diagrams touch. And I don't know if that means that we're seeing a multifaceted aspect of one thing or if we are simply seeing the way that different phenomena use similar methods. You know, I, I do think that regardless of what the true objective answer is, if there is one at all, uh, I think that we need to see more pan-paranormal uh, thought go into these subjects. Not only that, but I also think that we really need to hone our hone down and focus on the minutia because, again, something else I'm fond of saying, we're missing the trees for the forest. We're so yeah. busy trying to find the giant answer that we're not looking at these other things that might actually lead us in a, in a, in a direction that might actually give us some more insight. Very good point, and I couldn't agree more. Sometimes, uh, as they say, the answer or the devil is in the details, and I think in this particular realm, I, I absolutely agree. Obviously, we're doing we're not doing something correctly because we haven't really made much headway. So I, I, I absolutely agree with that. Here's a very interesting question uh, from Ravensfee, who posted a question at the question bank at forum.theparacast.com. This is something that I've always kind of been intrigued by. And that is European folk tales often have plots that turn on food events. For example, Goldilocks and Porridge, Hansel and Gretel and the house built of gingerbread, Snow White's apple, or even uh, <laughs> Genesis in the Bible. To what extent do these fictional stories lay down templates for people who report contact with otherworldly beings? And also, have you looked to see how, if at all, this body of work fits with your theories regarding the connections between the sattvic diet and offered food and other conclusions drawn? Good question. Yeah, <laughs> let me take a minute to unpack that. You know, it's it's interesting. Uh, in older times, in the times when fairy tales really saw their genesis, pardon the pun, food really was a, a huge part of life because you didn't know where it was going to be coming from next. And a lot of times it would be uh, contractually given. There are you know, certain hospitality rites in Europe that would involve the giving of, of bread and salt as well. So it's certainly – reasonable that fairy tales would reflect those particular cultural motifs. There was one variation of the Snow White story where she actually uh, exchanged, she is lost in the forest and she needs a meal and she finds the dwarves and she agrees to sleep with one of them if they give her food. So I think all of the... All... <laughs> you're not going to see that one on Disney. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, you're not. Um, so yeah, I, I think that I think that in a lot of these stories... Uh, the main well, – with the exception of that Snow White story that I gave you, I'm mean, just talking about Goldilocks and Hansel and Gretel and Snow White. Um, I think that a lot of it uh, really is 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 to – it's about stranger danger. It's about uh, ma making sure that you uh, know from where this food comes from and to not be so accepting of hospitality to sort of be aware. It's interesting that Hansel and Gretel came up um, – because uh, it was an ancient Slav tradition where uh, they would actually uh, figuratively put a child into an oven uh, to bake the child. They wouldn't really bake the child, but it would be a symbolic uh, sort of uh, liminal transformation into into boyhood. You know, symbolically, it's the womb and it's also being, you know, the child being transformed by the fire. And that's paralleled in the Hansel and Gretel, uh, yeah, the Hansel and Gretel story. Yeah, exactly. What's interesting to me is that if you look at the wave of uh, humanoid reports that came out after the fall of the Berlin Wall um, and the collapse of the Soviet Union, a lot of these Soviet reports include bread. And I'm thinking about the idea of the rebirth from the Soviet Union back into Russia and possibly how that might be a cultural manifestation of that. Um, not necessarily saying that everybody who saw entities in that you know, 89, 90 period was tapping into some sort of – collective unconsciousness, maybe, but even if not, maybe there was an objective other intelligence that was using that cultural language to impart a special meaning upon those encounters. Yeah. How about um, the mind-altering substances? Do we have any stories or traditions um, that involve, let's say, uh, some like Amanita mushrooms or um, morning glory seeds or natural um, hallucinogens that um, occur in nature that may somehow end up being featured in a story. I can't think of any from the Western literature. I do think there are some from the equatorial zones 
You're speaking specifically to, to, to fairy tales or to modern accounts? or Well, both. In other words, mind-altering of food, substances, or liquids, um, uh, this type of thing. Well, I mean, if you, if you could argue that Snow White eating an apple and being put in the state of suspended animation was an altered state of consciousness, I guess you could yeah, say that. Yeah, I, um, yeah, that was, I think that would rate. But, you know, in terms of actually something along the lines of the psychedelic experience, not really in fairy tales. It does occur to a certain degree um, in, you know, modern accounts. I think of Orfeo Angelucci as being a great example. Um, some people having thought that he was actually slipped a tab of LSD into his into his drink or something um, or being altered uh, similarly. Um, but, yeah, <laughs> the rest of my thoughts on on uh Altered states and food can be found between pages one and two fifty nine of my <laughs> my book. Um, you know, it's it's the sort of thing where I don't think you can t- take a step back and be a little bit more serious about it. In almost every one of these, the creation myths about these entheogens and whatnot, it's almost always bestowed under the people by a god. So in some sense, this is besides Joe Simonton the only other type of uh, you know non terrestrial foodstuffs that we can you know actually study. And I think it's important to look at it through that lens. And of course, they all have their certain creation myths. Um, yeah, the altered state thing is a huge part of this book and what I'm looking at because there are lots of similarities there. Um, yeah, yeah, you could almost say, like you you just mentioned, that every one of these events could be considered some sort of altered state because oftentimes there is a a quality to the experience that is absolutely foreign and unfamiliar to the experiencer. The air is different. The, the light is different. Uh, everything seems to be different in many, many of these accounts. I was, I was just going to say, you know, and, and well, I mean, and people have these same sort of food offering experiences. Graham Hancock had these off- experiences where an entity offered him food. Uh, I spoke with a guy who goes to Cusco on a relatively regular basis for ayahuasca sessions. And he actually, um, saw a stairway fall into the ground and he was, he was, he's Irish. So he, he said, he described it as a leprechaun came up and said, Hey, how about you come have a drink with us? And he says he was about to reach the door when his shaman bolts out of the hut and just is, you know, he didn't speak. He didn't speak Keshwa or whatever the, the particular shaman was speaking, but uh, the shaman was freaking out and started dragging him back <laughs> as soon as yeah. that happened. Um, yep. He so might yeah, never yeah. come back from that one. Exactly. And, you know, it's, it's interesting because go, going back to Genesis, you see uh, the food of knowledge, you know, possibly a mushroom and not, uh, not necessarily an apple. Not, not, a lot of people don't realize that it could yeah. in some traditions, it's a pomegranate in some traditions. Yes, it is a mushroom um, being, you know, that being brought to someone's attention by a serpent. And what is the governing uh, goddess of ayahuasca usually depicted as a serpent? Yeah, uh, so, you know, there it's, it's this, it's kind of frustrating writing about these topics because you want to have footnotes on your footnotes. You know, it's just this right. web. It's just this web that you end up, uh, this web of causation that you end up spinning and, and suddenly you're tangled in it. Yeah, what were some of the, the, the major uh, source material that you, uh, you leaned on? Uh, obviously uh, the Evans Weiss uh, book, I would imagine uh, that's almost the Bible, I think uh, a bridge between the, uh, the kind of the ancient with the modern because of the time period in which many of the stories come from, from the uh, late 1700s all the way through the early 1900s. No, that's uh, that's a- absolutely indispensable. Um, yeah, yeah. You're right. You know, it's it, 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 they came from a lot of different sources. I really wrestled with myself um, – because <laughs> I think of I think of the Paracast as as being I think of this right now as almost being my doctoral defense right now because <laughs> and, and 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 you and Gene are the heads of the committee and the people who posted questions are my are my committee as well. Um, you know because- what we've been called a lot of things in ten years. <laughs> I like that one. Oh, I'm going to write that down and patent it. We have well- more to come with Joshua Cutchin <laughs> and Gene and Chris. You're in the Paracast. <laughs> Do you need a website? Well, you can get a great deal on hosting services with Namecheap's legendary coupon code. They're offering substantial hosting discounts on shared hosting, business hosting, VPS hosting, reseller hosting, and even dedicated servers. Namecheap is preferred by millions. It's backed by a money-back guarantee. Use the coupon code LEGENDARY to cash in on the special deal at Namecheap.com, Namecheap.com. 
First came Attack of the Rockoids, and it was a critically acclaimed success. And now there is the coming of the Protectors. A former military intelligence man is contacted by a space woman in a dream. A dream that turns out to be a nightmare, because evil forces on our distant planet are planning to conquer the Earth. This is gripping science fiction of the classic kind. Attack of the Rockoids and the coming of the Protectors. Find out more at Rockoids.com. That's Rockoids, R-O-C-K-O-I-D-S, dot com. You haven't experienced yogurt until you've tried a Mossy, embodying health and flavor in a true whole milk, green-fed dairy beverage. Every sip pays homage to our old world cows and the ancient culturing methods their milk benefits from. With over 30 probiotics, a Mossy's undeniably nutritious, refined, cultured sensation bolsters your health and awakens your passion for dairy. A Mossy's so good, and you need to try it. Contact your Longevity distributor or call 877-878-4203 or go to GCNteam.com. Ted Anderson telling you about Jordan Rubin's Beyond Organic Green-Fed Raw Cheddar Artesian Cheese featuring whole milk created through ancient dairy breeding, unpasteurized, untreated whole milk on the same farm the cows graze, containing natural sources of omega-3s, CLA protein, calcium, probiotics, and enzymes. I have never tasted cheese this good, and you need to try it. Contact your Longevity distributor or call 877-878-4203 or go to GCNteam.com. Are your Google search results killing you? Unflattering content in blogs, news articles, online reviews, social media, or other sources can jeopardize your reputation, your business, and your livelihood. Let Reputation.com help. Our patented technology will make the truth about you more visible while pushing down unwanted negative content. Improve your Google search results. Call Reputation.com at 1-800-831-0771 for a free consultation. That's 800-831-0771. Hi, Peter Vaccaro for ParanormalDate.com. Are you looking for love in all the wrong places? Now you have a chance to change that by signing up for free at ParanormalDate.com. This incredible dating site puts people of like minds together. People who are interested in the strange, the unusual, mysteries, ghosts, UFOs, and the afterlife, and so much more. ParanormalDate.com was developed for you, people seeking a viable alternative to the other dating services. You can join for free by going to ParanormalDate.com, and if you decide you like it and want to connect with people, use the code GEORGE for a substantial discount. Mark Rawlings, president of ParanormalDate.com, says so many people hunger to share their experiences about the paranormal, the unexplainable, or the afterlife, and so much more, and this is the source for them to meet and share that common interest. So sign up for free at ParanormalDate.com, ParanormalDate.com. And use the code GEORGE if you decide to connect with someone you like. Hey, Berkey Guy here. Are you still drinking unfiltered tap water? Does your water contain chlorine or fluoride? Will you have drinkable water in an emergency? The Berkey Guy is here to help you remove these and other potential contaminants from your water, thus helping you drink clean, purified water. We offer Berkey water purification systems at the lowest available prices online. Don't go another moment without Berkey System. Over the last 10 years, we've helped thousands drink clean, purified water. Join them by visiting GoBerkey.com or call me, the Berkey Guy, at 877-886-3653. That's 877-886-3653. We'd like to hear from you. If you have a comment or question about the Paracast, send it to news at theparacast.com. That's news at theparacast.com. And don't forget to visit our famous Paracast community forums at forum.theparacast.com. Doctoral defense. <laughs> Which is better than being on the fence. That bad, really? I mean, are we uh, really asking that tough of questions? Oh, no, but you guys uh, are not ashamed to hold people's feet to the fire, which needs to happen more often. So, yeah, yeah, that's true. <laughs> but we're having fun. It tastes good. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I just had a, a breakfast burrito that I think was uh, delivered from the gods or some some sort of fairy folk. It had a weird taste to it. I, I don't think I'm ever going to go to Sonic again. <laughs> Watch out for Montezuma's Revenge. Yeah. <laughs> or Sonic's Revenge, I guess. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah, I made the mistake. I went to a fast food place. Oh, somebody hit me. <laughs> oh, here's here's another one. Now, again, we're we're going to turn the tables on the uh, the motif here, but this is one that I constantly am reminding people when we talk about the the un unexplained livestock death phenomenon and the role of blood. And I always mention the transmogrification uh, of the blood into wine into blood and the uh, the bread into the body of, of Christ in the in the Christian 
uh, mass or the Catholic mass. This is another question from Ravensfee. The, the Catholic mass has it at its heart a food and drink offering, which the faithful believe is a literal consumption of the body and blood of Christ. Can we draw parallels between this belief and the reports you've studied? And do we, for example, see more food offerings in Catholic countries or amongst those of the Catholic faith? Absolutely. And I wrote that down. And I'm going to return right to it. I just don't want anybody to think that I'm dodging the last question about sources. So I'm going to get that right out right quick. <laughs> Okay. So, yeah, I, I tried my best. I wrestled with it for a while as to what to include and what not to include. But where I sort of arrived at was when things – when the trends that I noticed started to become predictive, I started to worry about that less in terms of the veracity of every report. I feel like I share enough DNA with Greg Bishop that I kind of am less worried about the veracity of every single report right, rather right. than aggregate in general. Um, having said that, yes, Evans Wentz was a great resource. Um, Catherine Briggs has done a lot of great fairy folk research that was uh, very germinal of this. Obviously, the work of Jacques Vallée. But a great underutilized resource that I don't think people pay enough attention to is Albert Rosales' um, humanoid catalog. Yes, humanoid, uh, yeah. And yeah, we've with, had Albert on the sh on the show and, a couple of times. And and sometimes you have to go to track down sources, and sometimes you'll go track down a source, and it will lead you to a very disappointing end, and you have to toss that out. That's just part of the deal. He has done a great job of just compiling all this, so that's a good place to start as you go in there. Some some of the accounts are just, I mean, you you're sitting there with your mouth open, scratching your head, going. This person could not have possibly dreamt this up. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So anyway, that was my oh, that, and also uh, uh, Thomas Bullard's Measure of a Mystery, which is just you know if you want to look at a, a nice big codex almost of of you know where to start with all this data, that's that's a good place to get. Wow, your that's I've in. never read that. I, uh, thank you for the hint on that one, uh, uh, listeners. Uh, Jot that one down, Thomas Bullard. I think it's out of – we should we should talk after the show, Chris, about some ways that you can find that. Uh, so back to this idea of communion and this idea of, of consuming the body and blood of Christ. Yes, it's a hugely important thing uh, and it's tied into more world traditions than I think even we realize. I mean if you look at – again, returning to ayahuasca, you have an entity that is God, food, and drink and you are essentially eating the God. Which is a very old established tradition of you know it's tied into this idea that if you vanquish your enemies and you eat your enemies you'll suddenly be you know as powerful as your as your enemies and it's it's in a lot of different cultures the ancient Greeks did it when they ate a raw bull that was supposed to be Dionysus the Ainu of Japan and Russia used to eat a fatted cub to consume the bear god and in Indonesia folk. It was actually a girl who uh, whose body grew into plants after she died, and those particular plants became the island staples. So this idea of consuming the yeah. god is important. And what I found interesting, I don't think he's the most credible source, but John Mack did study him, are some thoughts from Credo Mutua. Credo Mutua, uh, if you don't know, anybody in the audience was a, a South African shaman. Zulu mother, Christian father. Uh, even John Mack said that, you know, Mutua sort of lives in this weird space where he doesn't differentiate between the real and the, subje and the subjective. Yeah. But uh, Credo Mutua claimed to have eaten a piece of gray alien that his friend had given him. And he said that – Yikes. He, he said that when he ate it though, that he uh, felt like – he had uh, consumed some sort of drug and he tasted – he tasted tastes that hadn't tasted before and he saw colors that he hadn't seen before and he felt like he was one with the universe, which is very strikingly like a lot of the experiences that some people experience under certain entheogens. So I think that not necessarily basing all of my thoughts on Credo Mutua's uh, credibility or not, but I think that this idea of eating the god – is very much tied into this whole phenomena. Where I sort of come to with it is if we are interacting with some sort of non-physical intelligence, which I'm sort of leaning in that direction after looking at what I looked at, then everything that we quote unquote see is actually a part of one medium. In other words, there is no UFO, there is no jumpsuit on the gray alien, there is no wand in its hand, and there is no drink that it's offering you. They are all one thing. And in that sense, you are consuming part of that medium or the same uh, philosophical underpinnings are there. You are taking all part of that one medium into yourself, if that makes any sort of sense at all. I try to articulate that a little bit more clearly in the book. <laughs> now, when, just to get back to the concept of consuming that which you vanquish to acquire their powers. Is that where we have the legends of vampirism and stuff like that? Because you're obviously consuming someone's blood as a vampire. You know, I think that there is something to talk about in there. And I think that there's uh, 
uh, some more. You live life. in a place that sounds almost like Dracula. <laughs> yeah, no, it's Dacula, Dacula, Georgia. I, uh, everybody down here goes Dacula. It's actually a portmanteau of the cities of Decatur and Atlanta, but I don't think it quite works. <laughs> Yeah, it's it's interesting. That was a line of thought that I had to make a very conscious decision to not uh, to not pursue, simply because this was my first book and it's a lot of data to get my arms around. I I tried to find a way to sort of wrestle it down to the ground in a manageable manner. I personally think that the ideas of vampirism are probably more tied into repressed Victorian sexual <laughs> desires than anything else, but. Again, there is this idea of the draining of energy from someone through their blood, which is the same thing that you see in fairy lore. And actually, believe it or not, is paralleled in a lot of quote unquote alien UFO lore. Uh, David Jacobs. Uh, <laughs> All right. Well, now, of course, we're hitting a sore spot. Yes, yes, yes. I'm, I'm, I'm but well you might aware. as well, because this is the Paracast and we're not going to censor you. <laughs> well, you know, I, D David Jacobs said in a while back that uh, we could now know that uh, the way that entities eat is by absorbing through their skin. And I have a I have a lot of problems with the way that's stated because I don't think we can now know anything about this. But uh, there is a lot of parallel, quote unquote, research, parallel anecdotes that seem to corroborate that. This idea that um, aliens tend to consume through their skin. I don't necessarily think that that is uh, an objective truth, but I do find parallels between that and the way that the fairies would eat their energy, the way that they would eat their foison. Um, Robert Kirk, uh, who uh, Chris was another uh, good formative uh, formative uh, text for, to work with, The Secret Commonwealth of Elves, Fawns, and Fairies, um, said that uh, fairies would actually absorb this foison, this energy from other food through their skin. Which, again, is another startling parallel between uh, fairy lore and modern alien lore. You know, we have to absorb this first. We have so much to consume on the show with Gene and Chris and Joshua. And we'd like you to consume after the Paracast. Just go to plus.thepowercast.com, plus.thepowercast.com. Learn more about our premium subscription package, plus.thepowercast.com. You're in the power cast. <laughs> Thank you for listening to GCN. Be sure to visit GCNlive.com today. A lot of people's lives and bodies are out of balance. AlkaVision Plasma pH drops optimize pH level and get rid of harmful waste and acid. Just a few drops in water restores vibrance and energy and gets you back in balance. Now order two bottles and get $10 off your order. Sign up for monthly auto shipping and save 25%. Call 800-518-7615 or visit alkavision.com. Alkalize your body, supercharge your health at alkavision.com. Owe $10,000 or more to the IRS? Get on board with the tax admiral. Don't pick on the IRS alone. I'll cut penalties and reduce your overall tax bill. Sometimes I can even get it zeroed out completely. We're an A-rated company helping people clean up their mess with the IRS. If you owe $10,000 or more, then call the tax admiral. Call 800-287-7180. Again, that's 800-287-7180. 800-287-7180. Are you tired of commuting to a job that makes someone else rich, working harder than ever, but getting nowhere? Do you hate spending hundreds of dollars every week on daycare, having someone else raise your children? With our opportunities, you can start earning money as soon as next week. You get to be the boss, work from home, and live a happier life. At Be The Boss Network, you'll find hundreds of work-from-home opportunities that you can literally start today and be earning money as soon as next week. Go to freedom106.com and start earning money as soon as next week. You get to be the boss. Get out of the rat race. Work from home. Go to freedom106.com right now and change your life today. That's freedom, the number 106.com. Go to freedom106.com and start earning money as soon as next week. You be the boss. Go to freedom106.com. 
We use mobile devices right against our bodies every day. But growing scientific evidence has emerged showing serious health risks associated with exposure to EMF radiation emitted from these devices. The solution is Defender Shield, the most effective mobile radiation shielding ever developed. Defender Shield blocks virtually 100% of EMF radiation from cell phones, tablets, and laptops and starts at just $64.99. Buy now at DefenderShield.com. For 10% off, use promo code GCN. DefenderShield.com, the worldwide leader in mobile radiation shielding. We all know that Berkey Water Purification Systems are the most trusted name in water filtration. As an authorized Berkey dealer for over six years in serving thousands of satisfied customers, the Berkey Guy offers amazing specials for Berkey Water Filtration Systems. The Berkey Light Systems include a set of self-sterilizing and recleanable black purification elements that purify water by removing chlorine, pathogenic bacteria, cysts and parasites to non-detectable levels and remove harmful chemicals such as herbicides and pesticides. Order the Berkey Light Systems system today complete with two black Berkey elements for only $231 and the Berkey guy will ship your order free of charge. With the purchase of a Berkey light, the Berkey guy is also offering a set of fluoride and arsenic filters for only $39.99. That's over 30% off the retail price. Call the Berkey guy at 1-877-886-3653. That's 1-877-886-3653 or order online at goberkey.com. That's goberkey.com today. This is Dan Pilla. Do you owe the IRS money you can't pay? Are tax debts crippling you? I've defended people from the IRS for over 30 years. I've helped thousands and I can help you too. I wrote the book on IRS settlement and I'm telling you, there's no such thing as a hopeless case. Call 800-34-NO-TAX to finally get free of IRS debt. With the IRS's new programs, there's never been a better time to solve your problem. Call 800-34-NO-TAX. That's 800-34-NO-TAX or my website, danpilla.com. Hi, this is Tracy Torme, screenwriter, producer. You're listening to Paracast, the gold standard of paranormal radio. Ooh, there's a hidden talent there. (laughs) (laughs) It sounded like the the golem. Well, you know what it is? Some people say I have a hidden talent, too, and they'll let me know when they discover what it is. (laughs) Gift for gab. (laughs) <laughs> yeah. Well, you're a good broadcaster, even though um, some people might. I know what your hidden talent is, Gene. Your hidden talent is to always be able to bring something back to Supergirl. <laughs> That's your hidden talent. <laughs> well, I will not say, like Jeb Bush said, that she's hot. Yeah, or any comic book uh, character. I like comic book characters, but I like The Flash. I like Arrow. Yeah, see, I'm a dyed in the wool de- uh, Marvel zombie over here, so we probably should, shouldn't talk about this. So you're going to watch, was it Jessica Jones that... New superhero show on Netflix. I haven't had a chance yet. I've been too darn busy. Yeah, I've heard that there is actually, you know, as much as fanboys want to project a uh, comics war onto that, I've heard that there is actually some legitimate animosity, especially between uh, some envy of Marvel by by Warner Brothers. Well, mostly because Marvel has had successful movies, and Warner Brothers has had trouble making franchises work that well, other than Batman, and to some degree. Man of Steel, Superman. So I don't know. We can get into a discussion like that. But then (laughs) Fantastic Four, the latest Fantastic Four, which is a Marvel comic book character, one of the first failed. And by the way, I did have one or two conversations early on with Stan Lee. Mm -hmm. Really, when I was really young. That's awesome. That is very awesome. No Jack Kirby meetings? or No Jack Kirby meetings, not at all. That was in the early days when I knew people like Forrest J. Ackerman. We're talking about eating alien foodstuffs. How this gets into comics, I have no idea. <laughs> it's, your, it's, your, it's your superpower. I could use a superpower. I'd like to be 10 years younger. That would be a superpower. <laughs> if you were allowed by the superpower gods and they said, Joshua, we got a superpower for you, which one would you take? Well, you know, the obvious choice is, is uh, invisibility, but after the past week that I've had, I might uh, take uh, slowing down time as a close second. <laughs> hmm. Chris, what kind of superpower would you like? Wow, I never really thought about that. Um, time travel would be cool. Yeah, but I worry with time travel about affecting the timelines and all that stuff. Or maybe that's part of it. If you go back through time to deal with the timeline, doesn't that create something that already happened. It's preordained. We're fated 
to screw up the timeline. Like, we need to get Micah Hanks in here to help us discuss all the intricacies and paradoxes of time travel. <laughs> I'll give yeah, him a Mike, call. Micah really loves this uh, this subject. <laughs> I'm going to have to give him a call. I'll have to say, look, we are going to explore time travel. In fact, in the episode of Arrow, Green the Green Arrow this week, they dealt with time travel and changing the future. Yeah, I've been watching uh, the new uh, Netflix season of Continuum. So I've been kind of in this uh, time travel mode here the last few days. And he has a thing for Rachel Nichols. She's pretty hot. <laughs> She's not a bad actress. And, yeah. you know, I saw it already because it was on Sci-Fi Channel. So I got to see everything. I got to see how it winds up. It's kind of a bittersweet ending. I won't tell you what it was. Okay. You know, you watch it. It's a, it's a fun show. Fun show. Anyway, I don't know where we're starting this. The superpower <laughs> I'd like is to spend my age to about what it was 30 years ago and keep it that way. That would be a good superpower. There you go. That's a great superpower. Right. Yeah. You know, or I could just say Shazam and become the world's mightiest mortal, Captain yeah. Marvel. Yeah, I always wonder when Aladdin rubbed the lamp and the genie came out, how come his first wish wasn't for, you know, 10 more wishes? I don't think that's a wish they can grant. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's in the fine print. <laughs> oh, okay. All right. I knew it was it's, something. It's in the fine print on the bottom of the lamp. <laughs> oh, we'll, we'll have to ask Rosemary that when uh, when she comes on the next next time. <laughs> nice, nice. Well, here we go. We got some other questions that I'd like to fire off at you um, now that we've kind of gotten our superpowers uh, wrangled, and uh, it would, that would be nice to be able to suspend time or travel through time, or I guess it's all time related here. I guess we're all time deficient or. Uh, Time conscious. Anyway, <laughs> this one comes from Wade, who's been a long, long time poster uh, here at the Paracast. He's just past the 4,000 postmark, which uh, there's not many folks on the forums that have posted over 4,000 times. And he always asks good questions. And uh, he says in Fay folklore, it was said that if you accepted their food or drink, it was said you, you were doomed to stay there forever. Although I'm not sure so sure that that was the intent as in the stories i read were pretty much they were pretty much kept against their will until such time that they were no longer needed and we've already kind of discussed that a little bit but he he wants to know do you think there is any intent to offerings made to humans in our realm as per the various accounts to him it sort of sounds like a cultural imposition that we were put upon them as it was expected at the time as you don't hear about it much nowadays. We've kind of discussed that a little bit, but um, you know, I'd like to uh, dig in a little bit deeper with that one. And then when we're done with that, what is your take on the supposed Henry Hudson encounter with the pig-eyed gnomes and the transformation of his men after they consume some sort of drink? And he wonders if you've ever come across other accounts with similar results. Multiple group uh, accounts are pretty rare. First of all, what do you think of this, this cultural imposition uh, idea that Wade brings up, uh, you know, it, it's it's almost like you're kept against your will already. So, why the the food and drink link uh, to actually keep you there for, forever or or for an indeterminate uh, period of time? Well, you know, I think that it's it's really about the the power that that food has over us. I mean, you know, that that's one of the things that I had to uh, do a. And to check myself and be like, is this really something that's that's worth talking about? But uh, psychologists will say that uh, food is one of the most important things. Uh, Bernard Lyman said it was the, the symbol, a symbol, st symbol of stimulus for pleasant and unpleasant associations, and it was uh, calling forth a ton of diverse uh, emotions, and and was one of the primary governing uh, attributes of our own psychology. So, with my interest in psychology, I can't help but think that perhaps it's again to help serve to help draw home a point a little bit better. You know, at the same time, I, I kind of have to cock my head at the idea that this doesn't happen that much um, anymore uh, because it, uh, it, I mean, it, it, it does. It's, it's not a, a major motif that you'll find in, in abduction reports like bright light in my bedroom, feeling of out of body experience, grays around my bed. But I would say that it is a, it is a minor motif and uh, it, it, it's been called out as such in the past. I think that 
again, I think it's the act of offering. It's not like you have these situations where people are taken by the other and they're asked if they're hungry. So you have people who are taken for four hours off of a lonely road and taken into a you know a flying saucer. And during that time, they're given something to eat or drink. They didn't need something to eat or drink for sustenance. There was some sort of deeper purpose there. So it's more along the lines of saying – there is a deeper purpose implied by the fact that it wasn't necessary. Ergo, what is that deeper purpose? Was there a deeper purpose? So sort of working backwards from the uh, fact that it that it does appear and trying to see if there was perhaps some reason for it to appear. <laughs> Maybe they're just polite. <laughs> Southern hospitality. There you go. Yeah, you know, it's 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 interesting. And and I I as I go through the as I, as I went through the process of writing this book, I was never, I, I still am not convinced as to a lot of uh, the connections that that I've made. Only just to say that there are connections there, um, and uh, it's 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 still a, a place that has a lot of mystery for me. You know, this second uh, uh, part two of the of his question about Henry Hudson. Now, I faintly remember some story uh, about Henry Hudson. Of course, who was the one that. Uh, discovered uh, New York Harbor and when he was uh, sailing in he was an Englishman on a Dutch uh, or a Dutch man on an English ship I think um, the story you know of how Staten Island got its name is he pointed at the uh, the landmass and said is Staten Island <laughs> Boobity boom. I, I, anyway, I, yeah, nice <laughs> what is this about uh, Henry Hudson's crew I I, never, I I don't really recall this and pig-eyed gnomes. Yeah, it's 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 a uh, it's definitely a deep cut. That's for sure. <laughs> um, I got another deep cut, which is to move to the next segment with Gene and Chris. You're in the Paracast. Thank you for listening to GCN. Be sure to visit GCNlive.com today. Graphic Converter is the image manipulation tool for the rest of us. It does not use any database. You get full control of all your files. Want to view the images of a folder? Drag it into Graphic Converter and a powerful browser opens up to show your image files. You could use it for slideshows. You could use it to import images from digital cameras or from scanners. Need to do some image editing? You can do that too in Graphic Converter. Also, print catalogs convert from so many files formats I can't even list them. Download now to see if Graphic Converter is good for you, like one and a half million other users. Guess what? You could save money when you buy Graphic Converter. Use the coupon code NIGHTOWL. Use the coupon code NIGHTOWL to get a special price for Graphic Converter. Go to LemkeSoft.com. That's L-E-M-K-E Soft.com. LemkeSoft.com. L-E-M-K-E Soft.com. Most of you know that heart disease is the number one silent killer in the U.S. What if I told you for just $54.95 a month you could fight against heart disease naturally? At Heart and Body Extract, we've been helping thousands of people get back to a healthier heart. Don't just take my word for it. Check out all of the success stories at hbextract.com. Or to order, call 866-295-5305. That's 866-295-5305. hbextract.com. Don't risk it when you can take charge of it. Paid non-attorney spokesperson, Adam Pulaski of the Pulaski Law Firm with principal office in Houston, Texas, is the attorney responsible for the content of this ad. This ad is not legal advice, and the choice of a lawyer should not be based solely upon advertisement. Services may not be available in all states. Attention Zarelto users. If you or a loved one took Zarelto and suffered a serious bleeding event, you may be entitled to financial compensation. Zarelto is a popular prescription blood thinner used to prevent blood clots and protect patients from strokes. These serious bleeding events have led to numerous cases of hospitalization and even death. Phone lines are open 24-7. Call 800-261-0937. That's 800-261-0937. As the cold and flu season approaches, Silver Lungs is ready to help you and your family through the toughest of the year by supporting your immune system and overall health. From our best-selling colloidal silver generating system to our entire line of silver-based skin gels, nasal sprays, soaps, and silver solutions. Silver solutions remain one of nature's most powerful and least expensive antibacterial agents. Now you can produce your own for pennies a day in the comfort of your home using the breakthrough technology of the Silver Lungs Generator. Learn more today at www.silverlungs.com. 
Don't complain about your cable bill going up and up and up. Do something about it. Grab a pencil and jot down this special number. 1-855-905-MY-TV. The more cable TV rates go up, the better digital satellite TV looks. Say goodbye to the cable guy. And get more of your favorite channels in 100% digital quality for less money. Call 1-855-905-MY-TV. Sign up for packages starting as low as $19.99 and there's no equipment to buy. You get free HD TV upgrade, a free DVR upgrade, and free professional and installation you control what you watch when you watch it record your favorite shows pause and rewind live tv even skip the commercials watch local channels too at just $19.99 what are you waiting for pull out your major credit or debit card call 1-855-905-MY-TV 1-855-905-MY-TV say goodbye to the cable guy cut costs and get more 1-855-905-MY-TV 1-855-905-MY-TV so you've got to take a state construction license exam or certification. Can't decide on what books or what chapters to study? Discover right now how you can eliminate unnecessary books and wasted study time. At ContractorExam.com, our study materials zero in on state-required test topics in an effective, multiple-choice format. So whether you're a plumber, electrician, general contractor, or other construction-related trade, ContractorExam.com will help get you prepared. Visit us at www.ContractorExam.com today. This is Jerome Clark, author of the UFO Encyclopedia and other books. You're listening to the Paracast. A new answer had come from Joshua Cutchin on this episode of the Paracast. And rather than just talk about nothing, let's hear it now. Yeah, uh, there was apparently in like September of 1629, there some some gnomes had appeared and and were drinking and 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 some sort of magic liquor. I'm actually not too familiar with the tale myself. Um, I would say that the transformation really implies sort of some of the ideas that I that I really think about is that is that this idea of consuming food from the other is meant to have an effect and it is meant to uh, transform almost a psychological effect upon the the one who is consuming it the thing I wonder about when you say that is whether they are really and truly actually consuming anything or just imagining they are well, yeah, and, and and that's I mean, you look to the amount the, the the number of cases that don't have trace evidence of food left behind, and it's 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 it, it implies that there is something else uh, going on there, and that this is more of a way to gain access uh, to to the person's inner 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 self, a Trojan feast, you know, um, sort of where the idea comes from. Yeah, yeah, I like that branding. <laughs> Well, I'm, sorry, other, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm not. Um, I'm not very familiar with the uh, with the Henry Hudson case, so uh, I, I apologize for. Uh, well, what about other uh, Hudson Valley cases? Of course, the Hudson Valley is, uh, in my estimation, one of the more enigmatic hotspot areas on the East Coast. Uh, it has a rich tradition of of sightings, of, of encounters with uh, fey folk. Uh, of course, Rip Van Winkle, the the headless horseman. Uh, you know, there's all sorts of interesting stories that go up and down the the Hudson and the Catskills and 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 even further up into the Adirondacks. Uh, what other types of, of stories that fall into this uh, this peculiar sort of uh, offering of food and drink uh, comes from that area? Uh, I seem to remember was it Rip Van Winkle? They were playing uh, they were bowling or something and then one of them offered him I think something to drink. Uh, yeah, he, yeah. He fell asleep for for decades and and woke up. Um, or do, why don't want you recount that for for some of our younger listeners who may not be familiar with the story? And then, what other kinds of accounts could you equate from that part of the country? Well, you know, it's really interesting because um, you know Rip Van Winkle has has long been sort of a touchstone uh, for the whole missing time phenomena that you <laughs> you run into uh, with these with all these sort of different uh, different encounters. Um, 
But uh, Van Winkle had gone out uh, to the mountains and he heard his name being called and he saw some person in this antiquated clothing, which again calls to mind the idea that fairies were the souls of the dead. And this guy was carrying a keg up the mountain and uh, <laughs> the, uh, the, the, they actually um, they actually went to look for uh, some these thundering noises. And as it turns out that a bunch of uh, that a bunch of people who again look much like fairies were actually playing it was a uh, uh, bowling or nine pins something the pr- the predecessor of bowling. Um, but he doesn't really Rip Van Winkle doesn't ask who they are or or really you know even that he doesn't introduce himself and he drinks some of their moonshine and that's when he falls asleep um and then he wakes you know ages and ages and ages later his beard is longer and and uh and he is basically a man out of time um it's 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 really interesting to me you find similar tales uh, in in Celtic fairy lore as well. I mean, there was a, a tale of uh, two fiddlers from Scotland who spent hours and hours at a fairy gathering, and when they came out, they emerged. Uh, they, they emerged and they actually crumbled into dust. And a lot of times, you'll find people uh, come out of this experience. And they will, in fairy lore, they will actually have their first meal, and then they will crumble into dust. Um, and I find that interesting because you look at some of the experiences that uh, people who have – or alleged abductees have had where their uh, dietary choices have changed. Um, I believe it was the uh, Avis abduction of uh, England uh, where they actually uh, gave up eating – uh, meat and drinking alcohol and other things, um, which is interesting. You wonder if maybe some of the people in the fairy lore had changed their diets, they wouldn't have crumbled to dust. Uh, but it's 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 very interesting. Another component of that too, this idea of a change in diet, is that a lot of the foods that I surveyed, and this is getting back to a point that I failed to address earlier, um, a lot of the foods in the survey that I found uh, corresponded with the Hindu sattvic diet, which is the diet that was preferred by seers and by mystics. Um, it's not really that unique in terms of being a lacto-vegetarian diet. There are a lot of lacto-vegetarian diets. The important thing with the sattvic diet is that it places emphasis on certain foods. And if you look at the emphasis placed on these foods, it almost lines up directly. Number one, uh, highest emphasis of sattvic foods are juices and milk. And of the liquids that you see described in these cases, it's mostly juices or milk-like drinks. You know, number two, you know, b- grains. You see a lot of grains in these cases or things that people describe as grains at least. Uh, so it's really interesting the way that that goes down and the way that you see the people uh, who have been involved in these experiences with the other will also have – experiences that are very akin to what sattvic mystics might have, uh, clairvoyance, um, other psi phenomena. Okay. I like that. Here's uh, another Raven's Feet question. This one is a toughie. She does ask good questions, I'll tell you. Is there a correlation between food being offered and its availability at the time? Are these reports more common among people or historical eras where food was either hard to come by or the product of a precarious agricultural system that was often prone to failure? Now that in the modern Western uh, countries, at least now, starvation and malnutrition are fairly rare events. Is that why we were seeing a, a decrease in these types of reports? Good question. It's it's a great question, and I would say yes. There is definitely um, a reflection in the experiences of the culture at the time. I mean, you look at the sort of things that were offered in fairy encounters, the sort of drinks that were offered. There were always ales or or uh, wines or punches. Very rarely water, and the reason for that was because in the medieval ages, uh, water was actually less sanitary than the other these other drinks that were created by fermentation. Um, Similarly, you look at the modern era. Uh, now we ha- we do have things like pills. I mean, pills are a relatively common thing that are given to abductees. Um, again, with this idea of of, of recontextualization and and different things meaning th- different things to different people in different times, um, could a pill of modern day taken back to someone encountering a ferry along the road be interpreted as a wafer or as a cracker or something? Uh, I think that there's there's some degree of uh, of, of, uh, of importance there to that, to that, to that idea. Well, it's terminology and interpretation, uh, right. you, you, different, different things have different, different names and different terminologies that, that uh, tend to morph and, and evolve or devolve, uh, over time. So yeah, it, it's all contextual and, and it's relative to the time period. It's the you know, standard valet one-on-one. 
that yeah. uh, these things tend to tend to morph and conform to the terminology and to the um, accepted, um, I guess, accepted uh, presence of whatever it is it, during a particular uh, time time period. Yeah, and it's it's the sort of thing too where I mean I I have to wonder. I, this is mostly a a Western world phenomenon, from what I can tell. The specific offering and giving and taking of food, and sometimes I wonder, well, is that because of a language barrier, or is is there actually, you know, are, you think about the the areas that wouldn't be encompassed in, encompassed in that, like uh, certain uh, sub-Saharan tribes where uh, food is a is a very hard worked for and very scarce commodity shared amongst amongst the people. You know, I wonder if if that doesn't actually have some some sort of uh, role to play in these narratives as well. <laughs> yeah. Hey, Haji, would you like a date? <laughs> Bad dates. Eastern cases. Um, I, When I was doing my trickster book, of course, the trickster kind of plays into this. It, it interweaves itself through these types of encounters, which uh, often have a very tricksterish element to them. And some of the uh, research that I did from Asia, let's say, from the Far East, there are some very um, – just <laughs> – captivating stories from Japan, from China. What other sort of out of the Western uh, milieu and out of the Western context, uh, what other uh, cases uh, are, are worthy of noting from, uh, from the Far East, let's say? Let's hold that answer to our next segment and remind you that we have a second radio show called After the Paracast. You can get that show and the ad-free version of this show when you join the Paracast Plus. Go to plus.theparacast.com. We offer month-to-month subscriptions for six bucks each month. Annual subscriptions, five year, a year, a lifetime even. How about that, a lifetime? You'll never stop receiving access to the Paracast Plus. We give free e-books for long-term subscriptions. Unless you're Rip Van Winkle. Well, you know, <laughs> we might make an exception. Plus.theparacast.com, P-L-U-S dot the Paracast.com. With Gene and Chris, you're in. Eat Paracas! Thank you for listening to GCN. Visit GCNlive.com today. First came Attack of the Rockoids, and it was a critically acclaimed success. And now there is the coming of the Protectors. A former military intelligence man is contacted by a space woman in a dream. A dream that turns out to be a nightmare, because evil forces on our distant planet are planning to conquer the Earth. This is gripping science fiction of the classic kind. Attack of the Rockoids and the coming of the Protectors. Find out more at Rockoids.com. That's Rockoids, R-O-C-K-O-I-D-S, dot com. So here's what happened. I was placing an order online. The site went down. It took hours before it returned, but I'd already placed the order with another company. If your site goes down, you could lose business. And if you have a business or personal site, you'll want to know it's easy to run and it will stay online. At iWeb, your site is hosted on one of the most reliable networks in the world. Talk to a sales rep at iWeb.com. Use the promo code TECHNIGHTOWL for a special discount. Did you know that home break-ins increase more than 100% during the holidays? It takes just 10 seconds for an intruder to kick in your door. But police response to a home alarm system is more than 20 minutes. And intruders are in and out of your home in 5 minutes. Thieves know that you're not home and have presents inside just waiting to be taken. And if you are home, how safe will you feel with an intruder lurking inside with your family? That's why police across the country are recommending you use door armor. Proven to withstand the force of a battering ram, door armor keeps intruders out. It's easy to install and barely visible, and your door armor is guaranteed for life. Go to InvasionStopper.com for a very special buy one, get one at half off deal. These savings are for a limited time and only available to GCN listeners. Protect your valuables and loved ones this holiday season. Go to InvasionStopper.com now. That's InvasionStopper.com. Welcome back to the Paracast, the gold standard of paranormal radio. And now, here's Gene Steinberg. 
Yabba dabba do or something like that. I lost track. What do you do about dogs barking under these circumstances? I don't know. Take them to Thailand. They love them there. <laughs> well, we're not talking about having dogs for breakfast. <laughs> I don't know. Turn them into Nathan's or Hebrew Nationals. Well, you know, my wife is an animal activist, and she's after all these people who are consuming dog meat in South Korea. Oh, okay. South Korea. Well, they do in Thailand, Cambodia, all over. Speaking of the Far East, our question still stands. Uh, <laughs> I, you know, not unfortunately, I haven't read the book. I've been really under the gun, and I do plan on uh, absorbing it and, and making it part of my, my research library because this is a fascinating topic. I think uh, you are very smart to dive into this. It really hasn't been uh, dealt with before. There have been sexual encounter compilations, uh, which is a whole other uh, side of the equation. Of course, the Villa Boas case is one of my favorites. She barked like a dog, like an animal. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like Howard Stern. Yeah. Well, yeah, and you know, I think you could argue that the Villa Boaz case um, is is another recontextualization of this same motif because a substance was administered to him. And if you look at the way that you know, I mentioned earlier about this. Wait this, a minute, he was he he was asked to eat her? No, no. <laughs> Oh, I could say so many things right now, and I'm just going to keep my mouth shut. Um, it sounds no. like the satire that Weird Al did for the song Beat It by Michael Jackson. Eat it. Open up your mouth and feed it. What I was going to what I was going to say is that it, he was covered with an ointment before uh, being forced to have sex with this alien woman. And, you know, if you look at the, the what I'd said earlier about uh, some of these anecdotes about absorbing things through the skin, then you have to say, well, is ointment uh, another part of this food trope? Um, and, you know, if, if you include that, then the number of cases that you've got to include skyrocket. So, yeah, I would not eat but, eggs and uh, trope, by the way. I don't think it tastes very good. <laughs> That's tripe. Um, I know. I tried tripe a couple of times in my life. Better not say anything more. Oh, well, try menudo. That's true. Menudo is good. Eastern, right? E so Eastern cases. Right. Indonesia, Japan, China, uh, parts right. of Southeast Asia. It's interesting. You again with the idea of foods matching to to their cultures. You do uh, run into some some Japanese cases where. Uh, Children are actually given rice. There was one uh, story from uh, 1907 where a child was supposed to be setting out rice cakes uh, for an upcoming religious festival, and he disappeared for several hours, and they found the kid, and his face was covered in rice cakes, and he said that a stranger had taken him walking over the treetops, and they'd gone in all the, rice, all, the, all the people's homes and eaten rice cakes. And Afterwards, the child had become a real dullard, as it were. Which you know again it's, could be perceived as a as a variation on the uh, the the idea of eating in fairyland and returning home irreparably changed. Right. So, in, in terms of other cases from that part of the world, you just don't find them that much. I've looked into it and I I haven't found anything. If anyone has found something, I would love to find out about it because I think this this topic definitely needs a follow up in the yeah. future. Well, th that's interesting because I, I automatically you know the you know light went off in my my head, and you have the same parallel between this particular topic of food and other administered or offered consumables or ointments or, or that sort of thing, being predominantly a Western world Christian country phenomenon in, in, in terms of going back into history as well as, as modern accounts. And you see the same thing in the, in the un, unexplained livestock death phenomenon. I, I had thought about that uh, when I was actually writing that per that part of the book. I was thinking about the fact that you had made note of that numerous times. Um, yeah. And interesting to me is if this is purely a psychological phenomenon, you would think that the sorts of foods that people would be given in the West would reflect the most popular foods in the West, which I think we can all agree are meat and candy, right? But you don't see that. I could literally count on probably two hands the number of cases that I found, not even in terms of how well vetted they are, just just – finding things that involve meat or that involve candy. You find a couple of contactee cases where steaks are served. I found one not very well sourced tale about an Irishman consuming a hamburger on a spacecraft. And then in terms of candy, you just don't find it. You'd think that that would be a, a good tool in the alien arsenal. Hey, kid, you want some candy? Yeah. <laughs> now, now, having said yeah, that, kids, about... kids, kids are taught not to accept candy from strangers, <laughs> especially alien strangers. It's true. It's true. Returning also to the Asian thing, I mean, 
in terms of modern era accounts or actually like, you know, first person accounts, I didn't find anything. There are myths. There are some people in, uh, for example, uh, I don't really think you count New Zealand as the far east, but the Maori of New Zealand say that you can go visit your dead lover as long as you don't eat anything. And in Mesopotamian mythology, um, the hero Adab refused food from the god Anu, although it promised him immortality, he could never return. Uh, again, there's some other mythology in Japan where a goddess died in childbirth and ate food in the afterlife, and so she couldn't return either. So it, in terms of mythology, it definitely is a worldwide uh, phenomenon. Well, how about you, Gene? What do you think? Are you a worldwide phenomenon? Actually, I'm a worldwide nightmare. <laughs> oh, my. Let me okay. ask you something here. We're talking a lot about historical stuff. What about events that occurred more recently. Yeah, you don't find a lot of stuff since the turn of our new century. I mean, you find some stuff like there was a an article in Pravda about a there a woman being made to uh, live with a yeti and eat raw meat. There was one interesting account uh, out of Spain from the year 2000 where a uh, a liberal arts professor was hunting with his students and he he actually ended up falling asleep beneath a tree, shades of Rip Van Winkle. And he awoke to find himself being drugged into the spacecraft by this tentacle. And once he was once he was awakened there, he found some entities that told him that their craft had affected him in some way and they had to take him and sort of help him back to health. Shades of Travis Walton. But while he was there, they actually gave him a, a red liquid and a hot broth and some sort of marmalade that he described. And he said that the meal would sustain him for the entire day, which, uh, again, implies that it wasn't <laughs> – to me at least implies that perhaps wasn't real food. Uh, this this was in a Spanish newspaper that I found. Besides that, um, a lot of the things that you find uh, are mostly from the 70s and 80s. I did find another case where some children in the Philippines supposedly gave a dwarf a biscuit in 2004. But that's that's the other direction of, of exchange. We have a question from one of our premier posters and also a um, good friend of the show, Burnt State, uh, who asks, in your book, you highlight the notion that alien food and drink are often prepared for us as if this is a mythic offering of ambrosia from the gods, something that will change us or return us back home. But what are your thoughts on cases that break such patterns, such as the, the uh, I think, em- Emelson 1978 Polish abduction case? where the little green men in divers' outfits offered Jan Wolski some icicle-shaped crumbly food that they were eating, but that he rejects. Is this uh, kind of a uh, sort of a runs counter to, you know, your normal uh, cases where where the offering is accepted? I mean, how how many uh, cases do we have, um, especially uh, 20th century cases or 21st century cases, where the offering is rejected by the um, by the victim of, of the uh, particular event. It's rare. And, you know, it's interesting because I, I find it really funny. I, I wouldn't accept food from somebody who came to my door right now. Nonetheless, you know, <laughs> an alien aboard a craft. But a lot of people tend to act uh, of, uh, you know, under – not even under duress, but just of their own free will. But it's like they're actually being controlled somehow externally. I mean I think of the, uh, of the Higdon case. Uh, was it Charlie Higdon, I believe? Uh, he was a uh, Carl Hickman. That's right. He was a bow hunter, and he uh, was actually he was she shot at an elk, and the bullet stopped, and this yellow man appeared in front of him and floated some pills to him, and he said later that he never even takes aspirin. You know, um, he doesn't take anything unless a doctor prescribes him. But he took those pills, which is sort of odd. I think in the Wolski case, um, I think the it's important to look at. Um, I think you can sort of derive entity intent from how forcefully they suggest food. <laughs> so if you have, you know, gray aliens who are administering a ball gag to give you liquid, which has happened in some cases apparently, um, that's a completely different uh, scenario than in the Wolski case where you know this this food was offered and was rejected and it was it was no big deal, you know, no problem, bro. Um, so yeah, it's it's people are acting. People don't seem to be acting of their own volition, which again. I, I think says something about the sort of state of mind that they're in during these experiences. Yeah, because everything does seem different. With Gene and Chris and Joshua, you're in the podcast. <laughs> Neighbors, are you tired of dealing with a slow web hosting provider? Well, check out 
A2 hosting and their screaming fast Swift server platform. They even have SSDs that load pages 300% faster than the competition. Ready to give your site a speed boost? Well, tell you what, neighbors, head on over to a2hosting.com. That's A2, that's number two, a2hosting.com. Check out their Prime Hosting account. And get this, neighbors, they're even giving you an exclusive 25% off discount for all our listeners. 25%. And remember, their Guru Crew support team is standing by 24-7, 365 days a year to answer any of your questions. Now, to get the discount, use the coupon code GENE when you check out. Do you owe $10,000 or more to the IRS? Then get on board with the tax admiral and let us steer your way to financial freedom. The IRS is the largest collection agency in the world. They can freeze your bank accounts, seize your car, home, will garnish your paychecks and benefits. Don't take on the IRS alone. I can fight for you using industry secrets that can help stop the IRS. I'll cut your penalties, slash your interest, and reduce your overall tax bill. Sometimes I can even get it zeroed out completely. We're an A-rated company with over 30 years experience helping people clean up their mess with the IRS. And we have a 95% customer satisfaction rating. If you owe $10,000 or more to the IRS, are facing an audit, a lien, or levy, then call me right away. Call 800-287-7180. Again, that's 800-287-7180. 800-287-7180. 800-287-7180. Just recently, we've witnessed some of the most catastrophic disasters in history. Be sure to prepare yourself with great-tasting, high-quality, GMO-free food that has a 25-year shelf life. Of course, we're talking about the foods from SurvivalFoodAlliance.com. And don't forget, the human body needs up to three quarts of water every day to remain healthy and hydrated. So check out our water bricks at SurvivalFoodAlliance.com. Go to SurvivalFoodAlliance.com or call 877-223-1776. This is a healthcare alert from the Pain Relief Hotline. If you, a family member, or a loved one suffers from knee, back, shoulder, or ankle pain and have Medicare as your primary insurance, we've got great news. You don't have to suffer any longer. You can immediately qualify for a pain relieving brace at little or no cost to you by calling our 24 7 pain relief hotline at 866 389 0620. Delivery is free and all paperwork is handled for you. If you are on Medicare and have knee, back, shoulder, or ankle pain, don't wait you can qualify to immediately receive a pain-relieving brace at little or no cost by calling our 24-7 pain hotline now at 866-389-0620. Our representatives are standing by 24-7 to take your call and rush you your pain-relieving brace at little or no cost to you. Shipping is free and all paperwork is handled for you. Just call 866-389-0620. That's 866-389-0620. Again, 866-389-0620. Hi, I'm Rick Osick with Famous Footwear. Did you know that premature birth is the number one killer of babies? That's why we support the March of Dimes in the fight against premature birth. Join us in supporting cutting edge research, treatment programs, and outreach to help moms have full term pregnancies and healthy babies. Learn how you can help save babies' lives at marchofdimes.org. We'd like to hear from you. If you have a comment or question about the Paracast, send it to news at theparacast.com. That's news at theparacast.com. And don't forget to visit our famous Paracast community forums at forum.theparacast.com. We have Joshua Cushion, and we're talking about alien foodstuffs or foodstuffs from the gods or some sort of thing like that. The book is called The Trojan Feast, the food and drink offerings of aliens, fairies, and Sasquatch, but not Gene and Chris. Chris, you had a comment? Well, I was, I was just going to um, comment that uh, w- when you're in the proximity of unusual beings, uh, creatures, your, your total environment seems to change almost um, in a, you know, hallucinogenic way. Uh, you know, we, everything seems brighter or uh, you see colors that you're not used to. Um, 
there seems to be a crackle in the air. I mean, there's common, uh, you know, case after case after case. You you have people that that um, seem to be suspended into some other form of reality that has enough familiarity with, uh, you know, the person. But there's something uh, energetically different. Um, you know, just things seem to be uh, more vibrant. Uh, you know, you you get this kind of underlying current of, of descriptions um, through many, many cases. And um, that could, I think, uh, psychologically um, possibly help induce uh, behavior that normally wouldn't be um, exhibited by by someone. I think if you're if you're taken out of your, you know, everyday reality, then all bets are off on how you're going to respond to to certain stimuli or certain situations. And and that might possibly be one of the explanations for people accepting things that they normally wouldn't uh, accept because the, just the whole vibe of, of the experience is so different. And there's, there's a veneer of, of, of kind of breathless high strangeness that uh, if it's not fearful, fear inducing, and it's neutral or in, in maybe it even in, induces some sort of ecstatic response from the, from the person, then possibly they may uh, accept food. They may accept drinks. They may, if they're not in a place of, of total terror or fear, then, then I could see that psychologically there could be some, some rationale for uh, people uh, accepting these things just almost as an, as an automatic response to the, to the offering. You know, one one uh, question here. I'm not sure if we really covered fully how you got interested in Freudiana uh, to begin with. I mean, w- w- give us a little sense of of how you got interested in these subjects to begin with. I mean, obviously you're, you're a very bright guy. You know, you play <laughs> you play this uh, in a very objective sort of let the data kind of uh, tell the story uh, sort of way, which we really like. Uh, the guests that. that that are very objective and very neutral tend to be the guests that uh, Gene and I <laughs> really like. It's the people that are totally, you know, immersed in their subjectiveness that um, tend to mm, make us squirm a little bit. <laughs> but um, how did you get interested in all this? Uh, I mean, how old were you? What uh, What are your um, inspirations uh, from from your past that really got you involved in, in this whole uh, realm in the first place? Well, you know, I, first of all, I really admire those kind words, uh, Chris, because uh, I'm I've been petrified about this <laughs> this interview all week. I've been looking forward to it, and this was, you know, when I when I when I first started writing this book, I said I kind of want to write this book just to have a chance to talk to these people, and and the two of you are some people that I wanted a chance to talk to, and it, it, those I've, I've been really nervous about this, so that means a lot, but. Uh, I didn't have really an experience before I got interested in this. Um, I was a a monster kid. If it was a monster or a dinosaur or something, I was all over it. I was in, interested in it. And uh, my parents never shied away from any of these strange subjects. In fact, um, it wasn't until you know it wasn't until really I guess I started writing the book that I realized there was such a stigma around some of these subjects uh, because you know this idea of inquiry and this idea of openness was always encouraged in my family. So, you know, I'd been – I'd touched upon it here and there. I'd, I'd always tried to – you know, I was, I was big into Sasquatch. Sasquatch was my gateway drug into all this. I didn't really come <laughs> – sorry, what was that? No, that was good. I like that, your <laughs> gateway drug. Okay, cool. Well, yeah, well, mine, I mean, because, mine too, actually. Well, it's, it's, it's a very simple thing to wrap your mind around, you know, at first at least it is. It was, uh, you know, it, it was something that, okay, well, it, sure, sure, big, hairy monster in the woods. That's totally possible. Um, I didn't really come back to this subject. Like I said, I'd had a passing interest in it here and there. I didn't really come back to the subject in depth until I um, had some free time around the holidays. I worked at the University of Georgia at that time, and I was trying to find something to fill up my ears. And I discovered paranormal podcasts of all uh, variety and sorts, starting with Mysterious Universe, which again is a good gateway drug for people um, because they, they go, those guys are, are real funny and, and do a, put together a really, really tight show. And I started listening to that and I got more and more immersed in the subject. And it really, really was that moment reading J. Robert Alley's Raincoast Sasquatch that I really had that light bulb moment. I said, nobody's written this book. Nobody's going to write this book. So let's write this book. And then, you know, once you do that, the die is cast. I mean, I am sure that I've applied for jobs in the past since I've written this book and I haven't gotten <laughs> to the second interview because they've Googled my name and found this crazy book that I've written. But, uh, you know, uh, this is what I'm doing now. So I'm doubling down on this. Um, 
I still uh, am a professional musician. That's where the lion's share of my income comes from. And uh, I'm halfway through book number two. So uh, it's, 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 and I, I will say that of the people that I've met, I haven't really met anybody who's a jerk yet in this field. I know I will, but uh, so far they've been people who have been really of a kindred spirit. And I haven't had anybody who's beaten up on me too much for not coming to, to uh, conclusions. You know, I, I like to stay in this ambiguous area, area and everybody's really entertained me in that so far. Yeah. Stick well, around you... long enough and boy, you, <laughs> <laughs> I know they'll beat you up. Boy, I, I had to write the trickster book because so many people were dogging me about, you know, how, how much I was putting on the table and saying, check this out. And then not coming up with any opinions or, or real solid uh, in-depth conclusions. And that's where the trickster book came from. I since then been dogged about that. So yeah, <laughs> it doesn't be- matter what you do in this field. At some point, somebody is going to latch onto it and uh, take, take you to task. Not necessarily for your interest in the subject, but if you do it properly, people are just, um, like like my roommate from college, he read my first book, and I won't use graphic words, but he said, man, it was like making love all night and not coming. It was like, uh, <laughs> I guess that's a compliment. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> I'll tell you, this show has been going over the line more and more, and now we've jumped the shark. No, there were no George Carlin seven dirty words there. I could have used one. So well, you actually did on last week's episode of After the Paracat. Well, that was after the Paracast. That's where we let our hair down and uh, let it fly. Yes. In fact, we let in lots of flies. We had to swat them. <laughs> yeah, uh, I didn't know, Chris, I didn't know, Chris, uh, that your first book was called The Tantric Trickster. That's what I've been a good <laughs> name for it. <laughs> well, you and I should co-write a book uh, called Hot and Bothered, uh, Sexual <laughs> uh, Encounters uh, in the Paranormal. <laughs> Yeah. Which is a, a, a kind of a book I've been sort of mulling over because I've got a quite a, a, a bit of research I've I've done that just uh, makes me scratch my head and go. Hmm, there I'm might all, be a book. I'm all about it, and you know, uh, on all seriousness, um, you know, a lot of these, a lot of the things that I've looked into have dovetailed and have some implications with food. I mean, you look yeah. at the two things. You know, food is essential to an individual's survival, and reproduction is essential to a species' survival. You look at you know uh, themes with the Garden of Eden. Uh, you know about food being used as a metaphor for you know carnal knowledge. Uh, I, I, I do have a chapter about that. So yeah, let's do the break. We have more of whatever we're doing with Joshua Cutchin and Gene and Chris. You're in the Paracast. <laughs> Thank you for listening to GCN. Visit GCNlive.com today. Hey, Berkey Guy here. Are you still drinking unfiltered tap water? Does your water contain chlorine or fluoride? Will you have drinkable water in an emergency? The Berkey Guy is here to help you remove these and other potential contaminants from your water, thus helping you drink clean, purified water. We offer Berkey water purification systems at the lowest available prices online. Don't go another moment without Berkey System. Over the last 10 years, we've helped thousands drink clean, purified water. Join them by visiting GoBerkey.com or call me, the Berkey Guy, at 877-886-3653. That's 877-886-3653. Most of you know that heart disease is the number one silent killer in the U.S. What if I told you for just $54.95 a month you could fight against heart disease naturally? At Heart and Body Extract, we've been helping thousands of people get back to a healthier heart. Don't just take my word for it. Check out all of the success stories at hbextract.com. Or to order, call 866-295-5305. That's 866-295-5305. hbextract.com. Don't risk it when you can take charge of it. Don't complain about your cable bill going up and up and up. Do something about it. Grab a pencil and jot down this special number. 1-855-905-MY-TV. The more cable TV rates go up, the better digital satellite TV looks. Say goodbye to the cable guy. And get more of your favorite channels in 100% digital quality for less money. Call 1-855-905-MY-TV. Sign up for packages starting as low as $19.99 and there's no equipment to buy. You get free HD TV upgrade, a free DVR upgrade, and free professional and installation you control what you watch when you watch it record your favorite shows pause and rewind live tv even skip the commercials watch local channels too at just $19.99 what are you waiting for pull out your major credit or debit card call 1-855-905-MY-TV 1-855-905-MY-TV say goodbye to the cable guy cut costs and get more 1-855-905-MY-TV 1-855-905-MY-TV 
As the cold and flu season approaches, Silver Lungs is ready to help you and your family through the toughest of the year by supporting your immune system and overall health. From our best-selling colloidal silver generating system to our entire line of silver-based skin gels, nasal sprays, soaps, and silver solutions, Silver Solutions remain one of nature's most powerful and least expensive antibacterial agents. Now you can produce your own for pennies a day in the comfort of your home using the breakthrough technology of the Silver Lungs Generator. Learn more today at www.silverlungs.com. My name is Bill Bonner, and I have an important message. Right now, the highest levels of government are struggling against an inevitable crisis, but they're about to lose control. When this happens, it will rip our country apart in ways you never imagined, from where we shop to the family you want to protect. Look, I've made predictions like this before. A few years ago, I warned that the housing prices would collapse. Before that, I warned that dot-com companies would crash, and they did. Those who listened had a chance to save themselves. But this has nothing to do with the stock market. This will affect us all. I've posted a free video at disappearingdollar.com. Maybe you'll disagree with my conclusions, but first, you need to watch this video and see the facts for yourself. You can watch the video for free right now by going to disappearingdollar.com. Again, that's disappearingdollar.com. We use mobile devices right against our bodies every day, but growing scientific evidence has emerged showing serious health risks associated with exposure to EMF radiation emitted from these devices. The solution is Defender Shield, the most effective mobile radiation shielding ever developed. Defender Shield blocks virtually 100% of EMF radiation from cell phones, tablets, and laptops and starts at just $64.99. Buy now at DefenderShield.com. For 10% off, use promo code GCN. DefenderShield.com, the worldwide leader in mobile radiation shielding. Hi, this is Joshua P. Warren, author of The Poor Man's Paranormal, and you're listening to The Paracast, the gold standard of paranormal radio. Okay, so UFOs and sex, having weird associations. Of course, we have that situation with some of these abductions where allegedly people have some kind of relationship with ET or they take sperm samples. They want to be clinical about it. We have Joshua Cutchin with Gene and Chris on the Powercast this week exploring alien, fairy, Sasquatch foodstuffs and what to look out for. Now, how often are we seeing cases of this kind through the years? Is this something that just happens on a rare occasion or if we go through the years from hundreds of years ago to now, it's loads of people reporting similar stuff. Well, you know, I, again, I, I, it just depends on how broadly you want to cast your net. You know, if you, if you look in, in terms of antiquity, I mean, it was a, it was a very common thing. You, you can find a lot of stories about uh, not you, sh- you shouldn't drink this or, you know, you uh, walking along with fairy lane at night and you didn't thank the fairy for their for their food that they gave you. Or if you <laughs> you're sort of damned if you do and damned if you didn't, because if you took their food, you were trapped. And if you didn't take their food, they'd be offended. So you find lots of stories like that. And then, you know, in the contactee era, there were a lot of I mean, Elizabeth Clarer was given some food. But the golden age of contactees had this. It comes in in certain waves. You know, you'll see a, a, a wave of people being given injections. You'll see a wave of people being given again. Do you want to, do you want to cast your net wide enough to include ointments? Well, if that's the case, then it's it's happens all the time. So it's just this idea of substances being administered, and and it's, it's definitely like I said, a minor motif of of the phenomena. I will say that you know I didn't find a lot of cases from between you know between legend and medieval era there aren't a lot and then there's a cluster in the medieval era and then from like uh, the enlightenment to you know kenneth arnold's sighting there's not a lot of stuff that you run into either well except for the fairy folk uh accounts uh, all through the uh, right. the latter middle ages up until you know the 18 uh, late 1800s uh, evans weiss has uh, quite a number of of accounts in there how about the great airship wave i seem to recall a couple of accounts not many but a couple of accounts where food or some sort of drink was involved um, at, uh, the pilots of the airships would ask for 
for water. I think I remember one yes. or two cases like that. Um, do we have any others that actually have consumable food involved in the actual primary uh, description of the event? Yes. N- none that I found that were explicitly um, offering food to people on the ground from the airship. But air, uh, very similar to the Simonton case, uh, a lot of airship uh, pilots or airship uh, passengers would request foodstuffs of people on the ground. They'd land or whatnot. There was a Indiana farmer who uh, saw an airship landed and a guy jumped, jumped out and said, hey, I need a pail of milk. And there was a famous story, which I think is – it might be a little bit dubious, but uh, there was a uh, William McGiveron of Pine Lake, Michigan said that one night he was awoken because the people in the airship yelled down to him that they wanted four dozen egg sandwiches and a kettle of coffee. Wow. That's cheeky. Yeah. (laughs) Small egg sandwiches. Uh, It just makes you wonder whether these were real people uh, aboard a real ship uh, doing really real things. Or if the point wasn't to make, if the point wasn't to make him go, huh? (laughs) I mean, maybe that was the point. Yeah. But how would an alien know about egg sandwiches? Uh, That's, I don't know. That's that goes up the sort of the Walter Bosley and the Arrow Sonoran Arrow Club. You know that these were real humans aboard fantastic new technology. Uh, that whole airship wave is it to me. That is really the the connective tissue between the ancient uh, and the modern. I think that that uh, that whole wave of of sightings uh, in a it, you know just encompasses the totality of the high strangeness of this whole subject area because it it really it's you can't say it's modern you can't say it's ancient it's it's kind of in between it's it's almost like a a series of of symbolic uh, events and encounters that sort of bridge the old with the new and uh, we're still seeing uh, vestiges of descriptions um, that you know, are, are surviving into the modern era. So what other aspects of Fortiana uh, are you attracted to? And, and what other types of research projects have you considered uh, moving forward here? Because you, you, you seem to have, you know, jumped into the pool with both feet. So, <laughs> yeah, yeah, there's, there's, no, uh, there's no washing this off of me right now. No, I, I, I'm interested in a lot of things. I'm interested in ghost phenomena. I'm interested in, you know, the real, the real deep 40 and stuff falls from the sky and stuff like that. The problem is with what I want to research and what I want to look into um, is to find something that uh, if to find an angle that people haven't really addressed before, um, you know, I, I admire, and I think that we do need more people out there investigating this phase of my life right now. That's just not something that I can, that I can do. Uh, so instead the way that I compensate for that is that I say, well, let me look at stuff that's out there already in a different Different light. So, uh, what I'm in the middle of right now is I'm doing this similar project, um, cataloging uh, smells, smells of um, ghosts, demons, uh, Sasquatch, Men in Black, UFOs, aliens, all these things, and trying to. I mean, obviously, it's impossible to do a survey of that because if there were maybe 1,500 possible cases. Um, out there about people receiving food from entities, there are probably 15 thousand thousand cases right. of of people smelling something but in a lot um, of it featuring sulfur and brimstone exactly exactly <laughs> and that's so that's sort of what the book is out to not really out to prove but that's sort of what i try to hope to outline the sketch in the book is how many of these things really do connect with sulfur and what does that mean from an alchemical standpoint what does that mean from a scientific standpoint uh you know i don't think people realize how hardwired we are to uh, notice sulfurous compounds, but it's it's like you could not really tailor a smell f- to be more noticed than sulfur or sp- specifically hydrogen sulfide mostly because sulfur yeah. actually is odorless yeah. unless it's burnt. It's almost like that particular odor is chosen to get noticed. So it's I can see why nobody's done this project before though because it's freaking huge. It's it's become yeah that's a big undertaking because <laughs> there's a lot of data out there that mentions yeah. smells. Because yeah. uh, obviously the olfactory sense is one of one of the first things that people are able to access and and remember because uh, smells. Uh, I mean we can we can remember smells that we had as as infants. Right. Uh, one right. of my earliest memories as as a human being is the smell of uh, uh, pickles, uh, the smell of uh, pickling uh, operation that my grandmother uh, was involved in in. In pickling, and, and that's one of my earliest, earliest, earliest memories. In fact, it may be my earliest conscious memory. Well, and again, it's also tied into memory in the same way that taste is. I mean, we talk about Marcel Proust in the uh, narrative of the Madeleine, 
cookie bringing back memories so it's it's, it's a logical next step um but yeah there's this psychological angle to look at you know look how, how how reliable are smells under hypnotic regression how you know how should we interpret it when people change their interpretation of what things smell like are people describing what they're smelling are they equating it with something else something that i wasn't really aware of is how often people conflate ozone and sulfur um, you know raising sulfur guys i remember the books from john keel where he's talking about the odor of burnt sulfur, sometimes at the beginning of some kind of paranormal encounter. What's your yeah. thought? Keel talked about this at length, at great length. Um, you know, the one issue that I will take with Keel is that he said that, uh, you know, these entities or whatever these entities or these craft couldn't emit sulfur in the in the amounts that are needed to smell this strongly. Well, actually, again, we're so we're so fine tuned to sulfur, you don't need a lot of it. Um, but uh, yeah, Keel talked about this a ton. Especially in regards to uh, to you know large hairy bipeds, he thought that might suggest some sort of uh, dimensional shift or release of energy that can somehow catalyze sulfur in the environment. I'm not sure about that, but there are some other there are some other issues to look at. So that this project is really taking a look at each individual smell from each individual phenomenon and saying, well, what could this mean? You know, well, hydrogen sulfide in appears in uh, you know in some abduction reports. What does that mean? Well, if you're exposed to too much hydrogen sulfide, you can have memory issues and you can have reproduction issues and you can you know so it's it's really trying to take apart each of what one of these issues is whereas a trojan feast was really sort of narrowing down the narrowing down the uh the tunnel into this focused look at entheogens um let, let me just consciousness. break let me break it sure sure we're gonna break it down more with gene and chris you're in the paracast <laughs> listening to GCN. Visit GCNlive.com today. Graphic Converter is the image manipulation tool for the rest of us. It does not use any database. You get full control of all your files. Want to view the images of a folder? Drag it into Graphic Converter and a powerful browser opens up to show your image files. You could use it for slideshows. You could use it to import images from digital cameras or from scanners. Need to do some image editing? You can do that too in Graphic Converter. Also print catalogs. Convert from so many formats i can't even list them download now to see if graphic converter is good for you like one and a half million other users guess what you could save money when you buy graphic converter use the coupon code night owl use the coupon code night owl to get a special price for graphic converter go to lemkesoft.com that's l-e-m-k-e soft.com lemkesoft.com l-e-m-k-e soft.com with a new year coming, it's time for a new way to look at weapon storage. Safes can't be accessed quickly and racks are unsafe for children. Covert cabinets are the next level in home defense. They fit seamlessly into any home's decor and they provide quick access to firearms while keeping them uniquely hidden. Covert cabinets, the ideal hidden storage solution. Custom made in the USA. Covert cabinets are an elegant and practical alternative to the bulky and obvious storage systems of the past. Find out more at CovertCabinets.com. That's CovertCabinets.com. Owe $10,000 or more to the IRS? Get on board with the tax admiral. Don't pick on the IRS alone. I'll cut penalties and reduce your overall tax bill. Sometimes I can even get it zeroed out completely. We're an A-rated company helping people clean up their mess with the IRS. If you owe $10,000 or more, then call the tax admiral. Call 800-287-7180. Again, that's 800-287-7180. 800-287-7180. Paid non-attorney spokesperson, Adam Pulaski of the Pulaski Law Firm with Principal Office in Houston, Texas, is the attorney responsible for the content of this ad. This ad is not legal advice, and the choice of a lawyer should not be based solely upon advertisement. Services may not be available in all states. Attention Zarelto users. If you or a loved one took Zarelto and suffered a serious bleeding event, you may be entitled to financial compensation. Zarelto is a popular prescription blood thinner used to prevent blood clots and protect patients from strokes. These serious bleeding events have led to numerous cases of hospitalization and even death. Phone lines are open 24-7. Call 800-261-0937. That's 800-261-0937. Hi, Peter Vaccaro for ParanormalDate.com. Are you looking for love in all the wrong places? Now you have a chance to change that by signing up for free at ParanormalDate.com. This incredible dating site puts people of like minds together. 
people who are interested in the strange, the unusual, mysteries, ghosts, UFOs, and the afterlife, and so much more. ParanormalDate.com was developed for you, people seeking a viable alternative to the other dating services. You can join for free by going to ParanormalDate.com, and if you decide you like it and want to connect with people, use the code GEORGE for a substantial discount. Mark Rawlings, president of ParanormalDate.com, says so many people hunger to share their experiences about the paranormal, the unexplainable, or the afterlife, and so much more, and this is the source for them to meet and share that common interest. So sign up for free at ParanormalDate.com, ParanormalDate.com, and use the code GEORGE if you decide to connect with someone you like. My dad was 59 when he collapsed from a heart attack late last year. Just this past August was when we spread his ashes on the St. Croix River. I loved my dad. But boy, was he stubborn. He hadn't been to the doctor in over 25 years. His excuse? He simply couldn't afford it. He wasn't a rich man by any means. At less than $107 per month, libertyoncall.org would have been the perfect alternative for my father. Don't wait. Go to libertyoncall.org right now for not just your sake, but for the sake of your loved ones. Again, that's libertyoncall.org. This is Jacques Vallée, and you're listening to the Paracast, the gold standard of paranormal radio. This has been such a quick show. You know, it seems like just five minutes ago, we started talking to Joshua Cutchin about a Trojan feast, and now I'm getting hungry. I'm almost ready to have lunch. (laughs) But I'm not going to eat anything that smells of burnt sulfur. I think it'll just be a TV dinner. Ooh, ooh. <laughs> that, that, that might still smell of burnt sulfur. I don't well, it's know. it's going to smell like burnt sulfur in a few hours. It'll um, smell like something. I wish not to say Jesus. what. But uh, well, yeah, so so whereas this other project was really sort of narrowing down to this entheogenic route, this other book is going to be more like a case by case, issue by issue look at things. So, and then there's some interesting some in, there's an interesting uh, light bulb that I had for a final chapter and epilogue today. So we'll we'll see how it turns out. Um, I've been really humbled by some of the feedback that I've gotten about a Trojan feast, and it's it's still I still have to pinch myself to think that people that I have admired have thought a lot of this work. So. You know, we love creative thinking and looking at angles that have been kind of just passed over. This is a, like you said, it's a minor thread, but it is a thread that weaves its way from the ancient accounts, from myths and legends all the way to the present. So, you know, I I really commend you. And um, also we really commend Chris Aubeck for his work in, in, you know, just coming up with the historical cases to begin with um, and then narrowing them down into olfactory and, and tastes and, and, and things like that. I think, I think we can learn a lot there. And there's, there's, you know, some people might think, well, it's, it's all subjective and there's minutia involved and blah, blah, blah. But, but when people say they're being offered food or drink or uh, being lathered with ointment, um, I think those are really important, uh, possibly key elements that are, that are, just not really ha- haven't been addressed in the way that you're doing and and you know kudos to your work and and for your creative thinking you know and i was going to mention that if anybody wants to know what uh sulfur uh smells like just come to my house after i haven't run my water for a week and i've been gone during the summer and then turn the oh lord <laughs> turn the tap on oh oh my goodness <laughs> it's like oh my god where's i know basil bubs here somewhere <laughs> where is he i got a well that uh Besides the arsenic, of course, which I absorb when every time I take a shower, the uh, the hydrogen sulfite does get a little overpowering if I'm gone for a few a uh, week or two. <laughs> well, maybe ET is hanging out at your home when you're not there. Well, it, you know, I guess if uh, if the devil's you know house sitting for me, uh, I'm not sure if that's necessarily a good thing. But is that like the devil's in the details? Uh, when it comes to H two and uh, you know, sulfuric compounds and the, you know, the lingering olfactory uh, impact that it has on your nasal passages. Yeah, maybe. Because, <laughs> boy, I'll tell you, it's when I moved in here, the house had sat empty for a year and it took about a month to get rid of the sulfur smell from the, from the well water. It, it, it just, and during the summer, of course, the, uh, well, I won't get into it. It's tough living in, in the desert. <laughs> <laughs> you take you take what you can get when as far as water goes, right? Well, I I don't I I, I cringe at at, uh, at just showering in this water because you absorb 
all these elements through your skin. And I do quick showers and and during the summer, I try to you know get showers elsewhere as as often as I can because I'm I'm real concerned not not only the H2 and the the hydrogen sulfides, but also uh, arsenic uh, occurs naturally in the water here. So it's not a good combination. So, oh, well, you know, there's a price to living in the drier side of paradise, I guess. (laughs) Uh, uh, Moving right along. Uh, Sorry about that. I didn't mean to digress. No worries. So uh, cool. So the next one's on smells. Uh, I can't wait. Do we have any cases of flatulent aliens, for instance, uh, (sighs) speaking of sulfur? Uh, I, I can't recall any any cases where somebody said it it, it smelled like fart. Well, no, they usually don't smell like fart. Here's p- part of what part of the confusion is that people will say something smells like sulfur, and again, they don't really mean it smells like sulfur because sulfur is actually odorless and less lit. But you do have uh, people who say, uh, you know, that UFOs smell like sulfur at a close distance. Um, you'll have people say that uh, aliens smell like rotten eggs. Um, I believe some uh, some uh, some uh, people regressed by Yvonne Smith said that. Um, uh, I, don't, I don't have my don't have my my manuscript in front of me right now, but. Uh, yeah, it, it, the more you look at it, the more you the, the the two major categories that you find in in UFO cases are rotten well, ammonia. Eggs and, ammonia is another one. Yeah, ammonia comes up with some degree of of regularity, but in UFO cases, from what I can tell, it's mostly sulfur and, and ozone. And uh, there's a historical conflation between these two. I mean, uh, the Greeks used to say that uh, that lightning would strike and release a smell of sulfur in the air. Well, now we know that's not the case, but yeah, this particular this particular conflation lasts. It all the way up until you know, uh, all the way up until relatively recently, until like I believe the 19th century. I mean, you'll find Benjamin Franklin writing about the smell of sulfur after a lightning strike as well. So the question is, what are people smelling? Are people conflating the two? Um, uh, so it's it's interesting. You have to talk about that some. Um, a lot of the cases that I said, like I've like I said, I've I found have have sulfur involved. Sulfur, ozone, ammonia is in, is common. But another common motif to all these things, uh, including ghosts, uh, is is the smell of burning, burning things. This idea of combustion is very important. You know, Sasquatch, some Sasquatch smell like burning hair. Um, you know, some ghosts smell like someone smoking. Uh, so there's something there with that combustion motif too. And I think I might have not nailed it, but I think I might have gotten a little bit of a, a, a an idea of where that might might be leading. Oh, nice. Yeah, cigar smoke too. Uh, tobacco is often reported in, or not often, but in terms of reported smells during uh, some sort of ghost, so-called ghost encounter, occasionally you'll have that um, that description. It smelled like someone smoking a cigar. For instance, in the um, we went and um, and looked into the um, the Studebaker Mansion in um, South Bend, uh, Indiana, and uh, one of the most common reported aberrations, if you will, or something abnormal is the smell of cigar smoke when, mm-hmm. when there is no cigars being lit or, or smoked anywhere in the, in the mansion. And most often this was reported in the main office uh, where Studebaker used to hang out and smoke cigars. This would be really interesting. I, I'm 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 really uh, intrigued at uh, how this book is going to come out, and uh, any sort of research that I happen upon in my work, I'll go ahead and forward to you because I do have a number of very interesting uh, descriptions of even unusual smells that, that can't be just. I think that that's also you cut out for about fifteen seconds there. I did. Yeah. You, yeah. You said you, uh, the last thing you said was that you uh, and by, thank you by the way. Uh, um, that that you had uh, some things that you would send me, which would be awesome. Yeah. That's the last thing that we got. Yeah. Um, I'll um, I'll go ahead and forward on um, any of these reports that I um, that I happen upon and um, and shoot them off in your direction. My pleasure. That'll be that'll be that'll be really great. I really appreciate that, Chris. Yep. We are just about out of time. Joshua Cutchin, can you tell our listeners where they can find more about the things you do? I have a blog that I'm trying to be better about, joshuacutchin.com, J-O-S-H-U-A-C-U-T-C-H-I-N. Uh, I just put up a new post yesterday about about Sasquatch and poltergeist phenomena. And uh, you can find links to my music there and links to uh, my projects there, and that's sort of the hub for me. And uh, Trojan Feast is available on Amazon and Barnes & Noble, if anyone is so inclined. We will publish the link to your site so people can go there and harass you. 
<laughs> Appreciate it. <laughs> they harass us. I figured we might as well spread the joy. Seriously speaking, we have a second radio show we'd like you to check out. It's called After the Paracast. And we get into all sorts of things there. And last week, as a matter of fact, it got PG-13. I won't explain why. You have to listen to it. How do you do that? You join the Paracast Plus at plus.thepowercast.com. That's P-L-U-S dot thepowercast.com. We charge a modest monthly, annual, five-year, or even a lifetime, but not a Rip Van Winkle price. Free ebooks for long-term subscriptions, plus.thepowercast.com. And Chris is working on our first video, which we hope to see real soon now. Really, a video channel on the Paracast Plus, and we started even carrying show transcripts there. We're looking for some volunteers who want to listen to a show and write it all down and then go for a rest cure after you do it. Chris O'Brien's site is OurStrangePlanet.com. You can find us on Twitter as The Paracast. You can find us on Facebook. There are two Paracast fan clubs. There's a group, there's a club, and it gets very confusing on Facebook. We'll never figure it out, but you can check them out. Okay, Joshua, thanks for joining us on the Paracast. My pleasure. The Paracast, featuring Gene Steinberg and Christopher O'Brien, is a copyrighted presentation of Making the Impossible Incorporated. Tune in next week for a new adventure in The Paracast.